G'day, welcome to the Matt Frad Show. How's it going? Good, I'm glad. Hey, look, today I interviewed Damon Owens. He's one of my favorite people to talk to. Whenever we get together at conferences, we'll sit together and have a glass of wine and just chat. And he's hilarious and he's amazing. He's done a lot of work in the theology of the body. So we talk a lot about sexuality, transgenderism, um, how to meet people where they're at, love them where they're at, and a lot else besides, because I think it's an over a three hour interview. So buckle up. Um, but I want to say thank you to a couple of sponsors, not just because they're sponsors, but also because I actually use or have used these products in the past. The first is Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W. This is an app that will teach you how to pray and it's done extraordinarily well. Um, you can download the app and listen to the daily readings and it'll lead you through a prayer experience. A lot of apps out there today are kind of new agey, you know, like Calm and other things like this where they'll have these sessions on how to meditate, but then they just kind of leave, leave you there. They don't talk about God or they do get into some problematic content as far as a Catholic is concerned. What's great about Hallo is it, the guys who run it are fully Catholic, okay? And the app is super amazing. So you can actually like listen to some Lexio Divina where this person will lead you through a prayer experience and you can choose to have like synth sounds in the back or Gregorian chant in the back. It's really terrific. They've got a lot of free content on their app so you don't need to subscribe. But I wanna tell you how to get access to the full app so you get access to everything on there for free right now. So what you want to do is go to hallow.app. That's H-A-L-L-O-W dot A-P-P. In the top right-hand corner, click sign up for free. And then just put your email in. And then use the promo code, one word, Matt Frad, M-A-T-T-F-R-A-D-D. -T -T -A -A and you'll, get, you'll unlock the whole thing for free. Also, by doing that, they'll know that we sent you. And that's, that helps us out a bunch as well. So please download that app. It's really amazing. I actually have it on my phone. Um, I was in adoration recently and I had my earphones in. I felt kind of weird because I thought, I hope people know that I'm praying, but whatever. And they shouldn't be judging me anyway. And I listened. I had this like 10, 15 minute prayer experience uh, where it leads you through Ignatian prayers and all sorts of cool things. Um, I really do recommend it. Check it out. That's hallow.app. I also want to th say thank you to Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is an ascetical program for men. I think men just want to take their holiness to the next level. There's a lot of men out there like that right now. They're like, I want to follow the Lord more intentionally. Exodus 90 will help you do that. For 90 days, you and a small group of brothers will meet weekly, okay? And you will read through the book of Exodus. You will pray more intensely daily, and you'll give up things like warm showers and sweets and snacks between meals. And you'll take on things, as I say, like a daily rosary or going to adoration. It's quite honestly, it's difficult. And if you're not serious about growing in holiness as a man, this is not something for you. But if you are a man who's like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to take my seriousness of the Christian faith and my walk with Christ to the next level. You really need to check out exodus90.com, exodus90.com. Now, if you go to exodus90.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there, you'll get three individual videos you can't get elsewhere where I help prepare you to go through this experience. Again, that's exodus 90 dot com slash Matt Frad. Check it out. Exodus 90.com slash Matt Frad. All right. Thanks a lot. And here is my interview with Damon Owens. Damon Owens, what's up with you? Okay, go. My, can you, are you good at beatboxing? No. No, but my, I make it really well. My son is good at it. Really? My the kids think day, I'm the he best. He just started doing it. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> My kid thinks I invented it. My, my kids, think, they started to think I invented it, but yeah. you know, when they're, young, they're nine they and ten. Yeah, yeah. Boom, <laughs> ching, boom, boom, ching, boom, boom ching. ching. You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, how are you? I am wonderful. It's so good to have it's you It's good here. to see you, my friend. You're one of my favorite people to talk to. Ah, uh, I have many memories of us and cigars and yeah. brewed places, coffees. Yeah. Oh, last place we met, that... Remember, we were, where were we? We went to that sandwich place at like one in the morning. Yes. And they had the WWE wrestling or the old ones, the WWF playing. No, you know what the, um, was that the, the, the beer and the hot dog place? Yes, beer and hot dog beer place. And hot I don't dogs. know where that was, but it was fun. It was so Milwaukee. loud. It was so it loud. It was Milwaukee. Okay. Was Milwaukee. And I have yet to find the beer I had that night <sighs> has become my favorite beer. Oh. And I've been calling distributors trying to get really? it. So that's, that's right. You told me this, night. but you said you found it. I did they can found send it. it to you by the six pack. They, no, they no? can't do the six pack. They can only do the big oh, liter uh, bottles. But. Do you know my grandma used to drink out of the liter bottles? <laughs> like a champion. Maggie Harris, you'd Maggie. have a bottle, cold bottle of beer. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's great. 
Do you uh, think that we're becoming less interesting as we become more obsessed with health? In other words, people don't like to drink beer now because gluten makes them fat, and so they. Yeah, but I think it's just it's, wish fat could come back. Well, you know, Chub, it always does. Wish Chub could come back. <laughs> it always does. I would crush it. Well, they say I'm fluffy. I think fluffy, fluffy is the new one. Or right? dad bod. Well, you dad bod, but I think the uh, the pendulum always swings. Right. So at some point, you know, there's only so much. Uh, lack of gluten you can handle and then right. at some point you're just going to hit the Give Waffle House. Yeah, right. mm. <laughs> so what's your favorite beer? I kind love the beer. dark I mean, yeah. Belgian, cut it with a knife, yeah. show me the monk who made it uh, kind of. Yeah. And I've got a collection of them in Do my... You? Yeah, even the empty bottles I keep just because they they, they give good memory. In your office kind of thing? Uh, yeah. Well, actually in the house I got you know my little... It's supposed to be a wine yeah. thing but it's mostly like big liters of obscure Belgian nice. beers that are ranked do you drink it, put the cap back on, put it up? Well, that's you... the problem. See, so I usually wait for friends to come by because yeah. I can't stand putting a cork back on anything, wine or beer. So yeah. um, I'll get smaller, like drinkable ones if I'm grilling or doing yeah. something. But when friends come over, then I break out the quark so and I nice. break out the... My know. favorite, one of my favorite beers, is it called Old Rasputin? Have you heard of that? I have seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's an English beer, actually, even though it's a Russian name. It might for be, thing, it but... might be. I just, I know that I go right to the Belgian section and okay. I see what What's new? What's new? What's That's not nice. happening? So I don't like the light beers. I don't, I don't do the, like them either. Don't the... Although not still, if it's a hot summer day, I'm in the beach. I wouldn't. I like an IPA. True. But True. if, but generally speaking, I like a. I don't drink much beer, honestly. Mm. But I like a black, dark. That's it. Beer. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Scottish ales too. Scottish ales mm. are good. Anyway, it's good to have you here. Thank you. What time did you have to get up this morning to come here? Yeah, four, four. Like really? Morning. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Well, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, you've been doing work in the theology of the body mainly. Is that is that the main thing you're known for? It is, which is um, <clears throat> ironic since I haven't I didn't hear of theology of the body until 2003. And Melanie and I had gotten into marriage prep, marriage ministry, natural family planning 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So we had been doing all the, the, the difficult sexuality talks to, you know, the cosmopolitan Northeast couples preparing mm -hmm. for marriage and relying on humana vitae and, and ways to connect, you know, these principles and ideals as young married couple that we are with these couples who are really just asking, what are you talking about? What does sex have anything to do with marriage prep? Mm. I mean, dead serious. Yeah. So we spent 10 years sort of bridging principles with people. Wow. And then when I heard Theology of the Body, I was just one of those, those people that someone literally handed a cassette tape, Christopher West, Naked Without Shame. Wow. Never heard of him, never heard of Theology of the Body. But having that 10 years of history, when I when I popped that tape in, I was like, this dude just did in 42 minutes what usually takes me a morning. I mean, going from, you know, principal to person. Mm. And and I just, from that moment on, it's just been this beautiful, just explosion. Not just principles and things, but also just seeing how, uh, how what a gift John Paul II has given us with uh, this breaking open of what it means to be human. Yeah. So were you working at a parish? No, no. I so how were you? How were you? So I was. I was an engineer. I'm actually a recovering engineer. As anybody's heard me speak, talk about. Yeah, what does that mean? That recovering. Means, that my my, my father-in-law's an engineer. Engineers are a little odd. They're, we don't know whether the temperament becomes, you know, the, the profession, or whether the profession, you know, makes you this way. But yeah, I, I, engineers. There's a lot of engineers in seminary. You yeah. find a lot of uh, in law. Yeah. And sort of my little mini analysis is we engineers recognize the, the world is ordered. Mm -hmm. There's an order to the world. And the thrill is understanding the order. Mm. There's never this problem like, gee, do I actually exist? Yeah. You know, like those philosophical questions. Yeah. Like, how do you, how could you prove existence? Yeah, you know, yeah. being, engineers don't worry about that. We're like, this is the stuff. How can we make something new? Yeah. And it's a temperament. It's a personality, right? Yeah. So recovering means I've had, you know, bachelor's mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. master's, 16 years with AT&T Bell Labs, and had my own engineering company for a little while, wow. and then left to go full time in 2002. Wow. Ministry. So it was a big, big pivot. What's different between you and me is <laughs> I had no source of income before I got into ministry. <laughs> I didn't lose anything. So you're used to poverty. See, right. mine was a shift. Mine was a. Okay, but yeah, but you would have been making a decent salary. And was it, were you decent. taking a hit in doing ministry? Oh my gosh. So like from. Dude, that's amazing. Six, to, six digits to zero. No, it was, it was. It was That's a huge. Always, they're very impressive to me. Well, God was very, has always been very kind to me. So I actually had what I think was the the, the strong call to go full time ministry probably yeah. seven years before I actually jumped. So I okay. knew back yeah. in like '96, this was something that yeah. I didn't 
there was no models. There were no role models. There was nobody to look at and say, oh, I want to do like him. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't there. So I was sort of like, oh, I'll just eh? keep doing this on the weekends. We'll just keep doing this. Now, there must have been someone there. Like, who was doing it back well, in the 90s? Was it back in the day? It was Matthew Kelly, who I didn't hear about until another 10 years after that. Scott Hahn, was he in the 90s? He was, yeah, uh, but he was still, he's a theologian, and... but he had the, he had the, he was still more, more academic. Okay. Uh, but as far as, yeah, popular speaker, the it wasn't a Catholic audiences. thing. It That's wasn't a Catholic right. thing. In fact, you go back, and really, that it, it didn't start to pop and develop until Christopher. West really? in the early 2000s. Okay. It's, it's an interesting history. And then you see this this explosion. And, mm. and the other way to look at it is, um, particularly here in the U.S., we have probably a 25-year gap between our evangelical brothers yep. and sisters in terms of lay ministry and work. And you can follow that 25-year gap you know, for like 20 years. So what we're doing now is where, you know, that lay evangelical popular theology, you know, was probably in the 70s, 80s. And we're just figuring out now, hey, write a book, give a talk. You, know, uh, you can actually do this full time. Yeah. So at the time, there was nothing like that. So by the time I was even thinking about uh, going full time into what we do on the weekends, mm -hmm. I had already sold my company. I had a little cushion yep. you know, financially. Yep. And, yep. and uh, you, you love this. The, the first contact was actually Catholic Answers. Oh. So back in 02, as sort of a, an apology tour of my own with my family. I took them on the first Catholic Answers cruise. Uh, an apology tour? Well, you know, Meaning like making up for all the time sorry. you weren't there. Exactly, oh, exactly okay. right. Because yeah. I was building, I was running a company where we were doing the whole. Ah. I was gone six days a week. So you were on a Catholic Answers cruise. Yeah, so I said this is going to be a relaxing thing, and then yeah. I met Jimmy Aiken, and I met yeah. Carl Keating, and I met you know these guys yeah. and Scott Maxwell, and you know, okay. and we started talking like, hey, come on out to San Diego, <clears> let's <throat> talk about what. So the, yeah. that planted a seed of, wow, maybe I could do this because I love teaching. Did, did you ever think of working for Catholic Council? I did. I went out. We interviewed. Well, I was looking at houses, apartments. Wow. It was very close. And then it was just it was just too disruptive. Um, you made the cool not yeah, to. Yeah. Because you have a lot of kids. How many kids do you have? We're at eight. We have eight now. Yeah. Uh, seven girls. They're beautiful. Uh, Your girls them. are so beautiful. I love my girls. And Nathan. And your boy. boy. He's, he's wild. He's number eight. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Cool, man. So then, okay, so you quit your job. And you were looking around at Catholic Answers, didn't decide to do that, and then you just started speaking. Yeah, and... nah, so that was, was strange. It was a strange time yeah. because um, my identity was very much still corporate. It was still, all right, I got to start another business. I got to, yeah. you know, make another, you know, killing on something else. And it was O2, so it was, yeah. it was a time where there were still, you know, really big opportunities market-wise and okay. tech-wise. But it would, like all things, it was Melanie, my wife, who I spent about a month after you know <laughs> leaving the company selling it and figuring out what i wanted to do and she says you know what you need to do just you need to, you need to speak you need to go out and right? i'm looking at it like that's no such thing that doesn't even exist yeah that doesn't even exist i'm yeah. gonna what am i now gonna be a speaker what I mean, am i what I'm, I'm going to be now a speaker oh, yeah. because i'm an engineer yeah so the idea it was a whole identity shift of uh-huh uh, yeah so that really was a slow going and it took about yeah three years but as you say, you'd been doing this for how long before Had, that? Ten years. Ten years ten of speaking. Years. So you'd been kind of like warming up in the pen. Oh, between New Jersey, New York. Not even that knowing that the area. father was maybe kind of exactly growing right. you in this area. It was a, initiating It was like, you. I love to do it on the weekends. We would do yeah. two, three pre-Cana marriage preps a weekend, just yeah. traveling around different dioceses. And, but um, that, never for money. I mean, it was you know, maybe it's, if I got a $100 stipend for gas, I'm like, woo. Yeah. yeah, look at this. <laughs> yeah. Covered my I'm gonna ride my bike and use the hundred dollars. <laughs> and I didn't care. Yeah. I didn't care. Yeah. So, but then looking at that from you know, rightly understood the business perspective, mm -hmm. can I support the family? That was the question. Can I pivot this? Mm. So going back with Melanie, sort of not nudging of of what's good, we were really, really strong advocates and still are of natural family planning. Yep. So my first foray was forming a nonprofit mm -hmm. to help raise the tide right? of NFP in the country. See, I never knew this about you. This yeah. is exciting. Did yeah. you know Janet Smith back then? Oh, very much. She was oh, I uh, like that woman. I was, you know, in the front row like this and by 95 when I first, you know, heard her speak, I brought her out to give a presentation in 97, 98. Yep. I spent some good time with her. Um, now I consider her a very good friend. Is that a right? very good friend, yeah. And then the years with the Theology Body Institute and yeah, she was you were staff. president. You were mm -hmm. president there, weren't uh, you? Executive director. Executive mm -hmm. director, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So we had her on staff coming in, and yeah. now I count all of these guys, Christopher and Janet, as friends, not just peers, but really just yeah. friends. Now, I hear people say that the theology of the body is the antidote to the ills of our culture because, I mean, we are so sexually confused. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? Wholeheartedly. Yeah, tell me what. Yeah, so this is one other thing I love about the the format here is to, to dig deep. Yeah, Usually right. in a in an hour and yeah. two hours or a day, you know, you say something like that just to sort of be the provocateur of people. You should really listen because this is an antidote for everything, right? Yeah. But not everybody kind of really gets the power behind that. And there's a lot of depth there. Of the theology of the body? Of the, and just even the making a phrase, like it's the antidote oh, to see. something. Yes. Like it's not just one of these pop things to get people's attention. There's, a, gotcha. there's, there's depth here yep. that's worthy to, yep, yep, to yep. unpack. Yeah, excavate. But most times it's it's you having to do it on your own, right? Mm -hmm. You hear something, it gets you interested, you take the next step and then the next step. And you look back and you realize, wow, this has answered questions about what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean? Right. How do I live my life? You know what really makes me happy. Mm -hmm. You know what is what love. What is love actually? Mm -hmm. So when I think about the antidote, um, what comes to mind here is is the, the disease itself. What is the what is the disorder, uh, culturally, personally, uh, contemporary uh, ills? And I agree with everything from the Second Vatican Council through um, Pope John Paul II, or of course Paul VI and Humanitate, mm -hmm. and um, Ratzinger, Air Benedict, you know, Pope Benedict, that what we're talking about here is not just moral evils, not just bad things or even bad people, but really a an amnesia. Okay. Uh, we've forgotten who we are. Okay. So now you're going, you're moving from morality to anthropology. Okay. You know, anthropos is man, logos is the, the word or the meaning of. So what is the meaning of the human person? Because one of the one of the themes that, that continues, whether it's in Joy to Be, the new ministry, or whether it's in Theology Body Institute, is we act in accord with who we think we are. Right. You're right. Behavior, Absolutely. conscious or subconscious, is always an expression of who we think we are. It's one of those human universals that you can go either way. You can come to build an identity and expect a certain behavior. Mm -hmm. And then when you act out of that behavior, it's like, oh, that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you can look at behavior and say, like, who, who do you think you are? Right. Mm. So the antidote language really is about saying we're not just talking morality, what's good, what's evil, what's right, what's wrong. Let's talk about who you are. And for those who've lived a certain amount of life with a certain under self-understanding, they come to this epiphany, this awakening that, wow. that even liturgically, we call it an anamnesis. I love right. that word only because it, it, it's the contrast to amnesia. Right. Amnesia is a radical forgetting. Anamnesis is a radical remembering. Wow. And there's actually a portion in the liturgy called the anamnesis mm -hmm. where we remember you, Lord. We remember, and there's like four different like expressions of it, sort of like the Eucharistic rites, right? But it's always about remembering, oh, you're God. You, we're men. You created us in your image and likeness. Mm -hmm. You created us and you love us and you're present and you've done this for us and you've done this, right? It's... Uh, the, the Jews do it when they talk about the yeah. everything that God has done. Yeah, right? recounting it would the have been enough. Of the Lord. That's it. That's it. So that anamnesis that is is really the core of what I think the theology of the body can offer. But like any teaching, it's it's static, it's abstract, it's conceptual until you actually experience it, or until somebody actually answers the questions that you're asking. Right? Mm. Great phrase that I use all the time. It says. There's nothing less credible than the answer to a question you haven't asked. Hmm. So we say, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. People are like, what the hell's the question? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're not saying that, but it's sort of like, oh, there goes the crazy yeah. Christians again. But if we answer the questions that they're asking credibly, then they say, whoa, I never, I never, well, then what about? Yes. And isn't that evangelization? Yes. Isn't that friendship and confidence and trust? Yeah. So if if answering a question that hasn't been asked is not a good way to go about it, what, what's the solution? How do you get them to ask the question in order to hear the answer? Because I imagine that's what you're getting at, to, right? To me, that is that is the question. To me, that's the the testimony of every powerful um, evangelical program that's out there, Catholic or otherwise, right? You hear these stories of men's groups that just they they have whiskey in the word, right? In, mm -hmm. in somewhere they'll have you know wine in the word. Mm -hmm. Their pints with Aquinas. Are, pints, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. pints with the seriously. What yeah. you're doing online, this is it, right? You build community, which means you have people interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, people that are just hanging out. You know, barbecue is probably, you know, the, the strongest evangelical locus mm-hmm. than, than even churches and parishes these days, right? That's fine, yeah. How many times you sit around with a beer yeah. on 4th of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day, and people that you may see once, twice a year, including your neighbors, and all of a sudden it comes up, man, my kid is ticking me off. Right. You just got this door open to talk, hey, what's going on? Mm. You know, hey, you know, I saw this was the other day. Is everything all right? Oh, man, this is this. So that's hearing and listening. It's seeing where the, you know, the, the points of either crisis or of delight, you know, mm-hmm. something great could be going on in their lives. And they're trying to find out, what does this mean? What does it mean that I got this right when I needed it? This raise came in or my wife lost her job. And then the next day I got this promotion I wasn't expecting. And, and he's saying serendipity. And you're like, no, that's the Holy Spirit. Mm. And, and even just making that comment, they go, oh, yeah, I figured no, you'd that say Christian that. Guy, yeah, yeah, I figured you'd say that because you're in ministry, right? I love the point you made that it's not about morality. It's about anthropology. That it, it, it goes to the basis. It's, it's not about what you do. It's about who you are because, yeah, if we've forgotten who we are, and people are telling us how we ought to behave and we don't know who we are, then behaving in a certain way or another way doesn't necessarily mean anything or well, make sense. I, I, was it the first or second Vatican Council that said when God is forgotten, the human creature becomes unintelligible? Oh, yes. Man becomes unintelligible. Yes, that would be second Vatican, yeah. Is that right? Second yeah, Vatican Council, yeah. yeah. Well, unintelligible, like, what am I? So one of the things I love about th- that is that it's not new theology. It's not new um philosophy. What it is, is a, a reordering of, of what is in our tradition. And I love the description of the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965, as being this place of a, of a subjective turn, right? a turn to the subject, mm. a turn to the person, to the I, saying we've got all this beautiful theology and philosophy, and we've talked since the scholastic period of the very objective terms. This is this, mm-hmm. right? And our logic in the church teachings is very deductive. Mm-hmm. This, therefore, that. And the conclusions are always very principled. Uh, this always is, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't believe it, then, you know, anathema sin. You are condemned. Mm-hmm. So very objective, very deductive, very principled. And it's really recognizing that as an expression of the deposit of faith mm-hmm. as opposed to the deposit of the faith itself. Mm-hmm. So you read a document from, you know, 1850 on... Um, the use of, I don't know, the um, in, infertile periods for couples to avoid pregnancy, right? And you see things written very objectively, very deductive, very principled. True. And, and I think that way, so I'm, I'm right at home with it, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, again, engineer. But that's not the deposit of faith. It's the way we choose to express it so that the world can hear it, what is good and true and beautiful. Second Vatican Council, really, if you want to put a wrap around it, was this subjective turn where it says, yes, there is objective, deductive, and principle, but the world doesn't think objectively anymore. I mean, this is a whole other conversation mm. about post-World War II. Um, what was the culture like after two world wars and in, in two generations? Interesting. And the baby yeah, boom. Have some and, water. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, the, the American dream and house for everyone and kids and all this type of thing. Mm. What was the approach? It wasn't an objective, it was very subjective. Mm. You know, this is what I want. It's about, you know, my flourishing. The logic was not very deductive, this, therefore, that, yep. right? It's suffocating and it's it's powerful, but it doesn't move people's hearts. Now people are very inductive in the mm. logic. And I'm not just throwing words well, it's, around it's, here. It's, No, it's interesting yeah. because, I mean, even when you look at arguments for the existence of God throughout church history, mm. you don't find arguments from morality or from my experience of beauty or from my experience of a desire that cannot be attained yeah. until relatively recently, you know? Yeah, and, and that's acknowledging that at each of these points, there are differences in, you know, reveal revelation and the understanding of revelation, but also the culture. Who are you talking to and how do they receive information, right? Yeah. The mode of the receiver, you know, yeah. receive into the mode that you're able to receive, yeah. however that's phrased. So what's the mode of reception? So the, the council recognized, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, that the mode of reception of the culture is not objective, deductive, and principled. <laughs> Their mode of reception is very subjective, very inductive, and very experiential. Mm. And th- this is a helpful framework. You can see framework. the sort of mess that yeah. that can make. Oh, we've saw it. We've seen it. Right. That's what I wanted <laughs> to point out too. So like even though it's a good thing to turn to people and say, how are you receiving this? And um, how can this be proclaimed so that people can receive it? As soon as you get to the subjective and experience, 
things can get messy and, and, and are ha- messy. And still are. And now you see people pointing back to the objective, like the syllogism, the this, the this is what the yeah. church teaches, be very clear. And and, um, and I, I agree with them. And both, It's been a mess. Yeah. It's been a mess and it's still a mess. But if we can analyze what the mess is, then we don't have to run back to some sh- safe shore, ah. right? We analyze what the mess is. The mess is that when we speak about the subject of the person, what has been proposed as a... I know I'm throwing a lot of words out here, but we got time, right? Yeah. Uh, a subjectivity, meaning that you are a unique, unrepeatable I, right? Made in the image and likeness of God, unlike any person that has ever been created before or ever will be. Mm. That is a profound reality, whether your authority is science and DNA and genetics, or whether it's you know theology and reading Genesis one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Being unique and unrepeatable is makes you a subject, an I, where you're not just a thing. But you have you have a certain level of autonomy. You have a certain level of, of freedom, mm-hmm. liberty, to choose what is good. But the confusion has been, and some intentional, that that subjectivity is really subjectivism, mm. where gotcha. now I'm the center of the, the universe, of, yeah, arbiter that, yeah. of what is good or evil. Right? We yeah. go from Genesis two to Genesis three, basically. Mm. Right? And and that whole discussion of going to the subject is fraught with all the dangers that we see. Of, of moving into a subjectivism where I can determine what is good or evil instead of respecting the boundary of the tree of the garden of good and evil, or yeah. the tree of good and evil. And that subjectivity, though, gives us power. It's worth the risk. Okay. Here's why it's worth the risk. Because not only does it allow us to be church in the modern world, borrowing a phrase mm-hmm. in the council, it allows us to see ourselves and God in a very uh, relational mm. uh whole integrated way that rescues from the moralism. It rescues from, you know, an objective faith that if I do this, 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 and this, then God will save me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not a a straight line to that. But when we objectify the faith into the things we do, how we worship and what we do alone, then it actually depersonalizes this encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. And it's not and that's a depersonalization that you didn't see in the mystics throughout the history of the church no, or the church fathers, which no, is interesting. No. So we're not saying that Christians up until relatively recently um, experienced a rather banal, calculated, impersonal relationship with the father. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. I think the danger has always existed. And there has been a, 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 um, a firm foundation of the church being objective, deductive, and principled to say, yeah. we're not here in the business of uh, evangelization and of pastoral work, that is the work, the right work of those who are around the water cooler, who mm. are in the fields, yep. who are in the in the public square, right, to bring people to Jesus and the church being, and that's a model, that's an ecclesiology, that's a, a view of the church. And perhaps not the only one, clearly not the only one, but a dominant one. So you don't see sort of this, but you do, if you look back, you can see these moments of, of, of choosing one over the other, because mm. I think this is another important point that just by making the distinction between objective, deductive, and principle, and subjective, inductive, and experiential doesn't mean we swing from one to the other. This isn't the pendulum. It's saying we've got multiple means to express the deposit of faith. Hmm. So it's one deposit of faith with many ways to express it. Allowing us to speak to the, the language of the culture means that when we are literally at the water cooler or standing over our lawnmower or the barbecue with a friend, yeah. we're not required to hit you know, the quoted catechism this and the scripture versus this in order to draw somebody to Christ, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now it's about you know, what's going on in your life because mm-hmm. God is all in all. God is the desire of our hearts and sort of that peace of recognizing that no matter what is going on with somebody, no matter what your background is, God is knocking on the door like, will you answer, will you answer? And part of the pastoral work, the heart of it is helping them to see in their own lives by the questions they ask, by the crisis that they're dealing with, by the things they've already deemed to be important, where God is knocking on the door for them. Now you've got a credible way of saying, well, you know, I don't think that was luck. Pretty sure that that's the way the Lord worked Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I figured you would say that, Mr. Christian. What does that mean? I've seen it a thousand times. Yeah. And trusting that there's already something in their heart wondering, yeah, who am I? Why am I here? What's going on in the cosmos? I always believe in the big guy upstairs. You know, yeah. I'm spiritual, but I'm just not religious. Yeah. And you know, you know, faiths are pretty much the same. And you yes. just got to figure all that. Quasi is somebody who's still got an open to the unseen, mm-hmm. to the unfelt, to the unknown, and to be able to provide that that witness to how it's a 
a natural connection to life, mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't put that on a CD. Tell us where the world is in regards to this then. So if we're, if, if, if perhaps the greatest ill of our times is we don't know who we are and therefore we don't know what we're for. That's the other thing. I mean, you said that in a different way, but if you don't know what something is, yes. then you, you may not know what it's for. Absolutely. So um, how does this apply when we're thinking of sexuality, transgenderism, all of this stuff? It's, it's all part of the same amnesia. And this is, this is my world. Now, you know, if you're a carpenter, everything is can done with a hammer and a nail, right? Yeah. But I see, the, I see it over and over again, that this amnesia, this, um, this loss of identity, coupled with the power of sex, mm -hmm. I mean, just the raw, natural and supernatural power of being made sexual, of the sexual desire, of the power of sexual union, of being just dimorphic creatures, male, female, right? And the fact that the desire, the attraction, the connection, the union leads to a new life that never existed before that will live eternally. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a power, a, a cosmic power that even if you don't subscribe to the creator of the cosmos, mm -hmm. you recognize that, you know, the history of the world literally depends on who's mm -hmm. having sex with whom. Right, whether you look at it in the yeah, past, that's a good way to put it, yeah. or whether you look at it in the future, yeah, right. So there's a power here that we can at least agree on, believer, non-believer, uh, is changing the world. Mm -hmm. And to have an order of that, I say that the identity, as a Christian, as a Catholic, is inseparable from our sexuality. This is in the beginning of our own family album, right? This, the, the Bible doesn't begin with morality. First chapter one, Genesis one, is not the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. as powerful and beautiful as they are. That's not till later in mm -hmm. the brokenness. It begins Genesis one and Genesis two as this account, almost like granddad around you know, the fire, telling the story, where do we come from? Mm -hmm. Dad, granddad, tell us where we come from. And there's a flavor here in the poetry of Genesis one and two, not as a law book, not even as a history book, not as a science book, yeah. But as your granddad telling you the story about, you know, he can reach back further mm -hmm. into the family history and tree and connect you to it so that you can look forward and see where you are. Very okay. familial, right? And in that story, it's a story of uh, who we are, whose we are, and why we're here. Three fundamental questions of, of existence. Yeah. Well, it begins like it. when there's nothing. The earth was dark and void and the spirit of God hovered above the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was. This is that dramatic moment, right? Mm -hmm. And the first account being this seven day ordered account poetry of going from nothingness to complete creation where God himself has to put the, the musical rest on and say, that's a good song, right? Finished it, right? And in that story, we see on the morning of the, the fifth day, of God creating male and female, six days, excuse me, where God creating male and female. And well, first is the beast and the cattle, you know, the creepy things on the dry land. And then God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness, male and female, he created them and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. If we're looking for history or morality, this whole thing gets muddled. Yeah. But if we allow ourselves to sit back and be the grandchild, the grandson, listening to granddad, we see this first story being God, God revealing who he is, who we are to him, and, and how we flourish in this world from his view. And we couple that in a very complimentary way with Genesis chapter two, the different tradition of that creation event from our view to God mm -hmm. that literally begins with the clay, the dust, the earth, the body, and God breathing his spirit into the body. And then man became a living being. And one of the lenses in the theology of the body taken from the Second Vatican Council, John Paul really just provided deeper context, is that all of the story of identity, relationship, and mission of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is really one of, uh, that requires a lens of communion. This is one of my main themes. This is why I go right to it. Mm -hmm. right? Communion allows us to see uh, first a glimpse into the very inner life of God. Then it allows us to see how he creates in these stories through separation, mm -hmm. whether it's the light and dark on day one, mm -hmm. and that together creates time, mm -hmm. whether it's the waters above and the waters below separated by that, by that water, uh, the dome, that allows this beginning of a water cycle 
where the creation of fresh water and, and the, the dry land separating the waters and the, to the basin to reveal the dry land mm -hmm. and the communion that happens now between land and sea. And then this beautiful trinity between the skies and the ocean and the water, right? Mm -hmm. And you see that, that God creates in his image and likeness. He is, he is pure relation. Mm -hmm. He is communion. How does this apply to the transgenderism question, or how do you how do you bridge that on a practical level? I mean, so, if you're chatting with someone who identifies as a different sex, uh, presumably you're not going to point to Genesis right away. It, no, and I think that's a big mistake. I think we do it often. There's just two points to this. One is it's um, you know if we were teaching you know third grade math, yeah. and a prodigy came in or you know came in and asked you a calculus question, mm -hmm. and had done calculus before, but asked you an honest question about calculus. You're in a dilemma as a teacher, right? Because yeah. you want them to learn and understand and you want to answer the question about calculus, right? Yeah. But you still got to get through algebra. Yeah. You, you got to get through the fundamentals so that you can actually operate in that higher level of yeah, mathematics. Yeah, yeah. So that being practical and answering a particular person's question about transgenderism is like the calculus of the Christian evangelist. And we have to be yeah. we have to recognize that this isn't about you know, a, a quick phrase to answer. It's not about seven things to say. It's not about memorizing a scripture verse or a catechism or, it really isn't. Those things are for our edification. Okay. So that we are more, we are more secure and solid. They recognize that, you know what? This is the journey that they're on. This is the journey that I am on, but there's only one map. There's many different ways to go. There's many different directions, back, forth, three steps back, the Jews in, you know, in the desert, 40 years to go a couple of miles, right? Mm -hmm. Walking the Egypt out of them for 40 years, right? <laughs> Walking the Egypt out of them. Right? But there's only like one it. map. There's only one map. So we learn these things so that we can build it. But if you're going to speak and you're going to do like this, yeah. fundamentally, it's not about doctrine. It's about friendship and trust. It's, it's being at ease with little conversations you can have around the barbecue. It's about knowing that this is my right relationship with you. You're my neighbor. You're not my son. Yeah, uh, that's you're, right. You're my employee. Yeah. You're not my, you know, my guest attendant, right? Uh -huh. I see you at mass, but, you know, we're not intimate friends yet. Yep. So respecting that relationship, it's first very affective. It's saying, I see you. Yep. I know you. You know, I love you. I will your good. Yep. And whatever you're dealing with, you know what? We're all dealing with stuff here. We can, we're better when we deal with it together. Hmm. And it's shocking for most evangelists and for most Christians when just that provides the opportunity to start speaking about objective truths, mm -hmm. about what things are. Because you can't give the answer again until they ask. Because they, and they will ask, okay. they will ask. Well, why isn't this, I tried this, this, and this from the book that I read and my daughter didn't respond to that and she got even more angry and then mm -hmm. I said this to her and I don't even know why she got so mad. And, then, mm -hmm. and, you, and, you, and you know the answer. You say, well, you know what? She really didn't care how much you knew. She's still wondering how much you care. Mm -hmm. Do you think so, because, uh, back to this subjective, objective yeah, yeah. thing, because of the amount of confusion that's in our society and in the church right now, that we're beginning to see more and more people just like shouting objective truths yes. into the void just to try and gain some, um, what do you say, some, some clarity, some footing. Yeah. yeah. You know, like things aren't changing. Like, you know, and I don't blame them in a way. I don't Especially either. when you've got different prelates and, you know, Catholics and evangelicals who are beginning to say things that the culture is saying. Uh, they're beginning to say false things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. about sexuality and sexual acts and things I like that. I hear them and see them too. Yeah. I agree with you. And I don't blame them either. And, and I've done it myself. Yeah, right? I do too. And I, I don't know if it comes from, it seems like for me it comes from both like a frustration. Like there just seems a lot of, like there's a lot of insanity out there and I don't like it. And it's bewildering to me. And so I'll yeah. say something as sharply and as correctly as I know how to. Uh, maybe I do it also for the edification of those seeing, so we can all be like, okay, up is still up, right? You know, down is still down. Yeah, yeah. But um, and what does that do? That fortifies me. That fortifies you, maybe. But it doesn't often help or convert people. It might help them, but I don't know if it converts. I don't think it does. I don't think it does. I, and I and I'm I do it all. I do it often too. Often enough that I, you know, I have to limit. You know my 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 Twitter feed because I'm I get outraged like anybody else with the you know whatever you know Twitter decides to send me to be like hey you were outraged yeah. about this before you'll like this one right, yeah, right. <laughs> like <laughs> you are right Twitter yeah, right. Yeah. and trust me I've got my my TOB references and catechism yeah. and like, I'd love no actually da, 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 da. yeah but then I look back and I'm like you know what 
that just burned like an hour at best of you know my day yeah of of what i'm actually called to do yeah. and i'm still irate i'm still like infuriated and i'm not even sure that people even yeah. in a mode of receiving what I'm giving, but I'm like, you know what, that was a direct quote. I got, you, tough, I got you some Fulton Sheen here to answer your question. You it's, know? Like we're, it's like we're impatient and can't, so what you're talking about is a very kind of human pastoral approach, like become someone's friend, love on them. And like, it just seems so uh, ineffective. Yeah. Like really, I'm gonna develop a friendship with somebody and then speak truth to them and they might not even care about it when I could instead, you know, have a podcast about Pines with Aquinas or something, you know, and just say stuff. Well, no, let's not, let's not diminish that because I think if we looked at, at a healthy uh, organism, the church, a healthy bride of Christ, the church, right? There are some who are teachers. There this are some who are witnesses. There are some who are, and we have to be very clear. My, I have a, I have a deep gifting that took me 10 years to appreciate mm -hmm. of being able to take very complex things and to, and to explain them in a way that people who want to hear them go, whoa, I never heard it that yeah. way. But that has kept me in a certain distance from walking literally with someone as they work yeah, through this. Yeah. That could be not just three talks, not just six months. It could be five years of them working through yeah. childhood stuff so that they can love their wife in the way that they know their wife deserves. Yeah. I mean, in a very personal, intimate way, intimate way. So moving into that kind of ministry now, you know, Melanie and I with, with Joy to Be and with, with marriage is hugely... Un, you know, um, disconcerting to me because I, I'm, I'm more comfortable back in this other role as teaching. But if we're healthy and looking back, we say, you know what, the church needs all of these. That's right. We I, need all of I've these. been thinking about this a lot lately. And I, you get this in your feed. Matt, you changed my life. I never thought about this before. That was exactly what I needed to hear. Yeah. And without, con you know, confusing it with real, um, you know, journeying with someone, recognizing this is what Catholic radio does. This is what yeah. redemption of podcasting can do. This is what talks and, and seminars and conferences yeah, can do. Yeah, it's almost like, I mean, St. Paul says, so we're all a body and the body has different parts mm -hmm. and like, that's okay. We don't all have to be the eyeball or that's something. Right. And to put it in modern language, it's like people have their lane. Yes. And you talked about yes. this to me. We were chatting in a Starbucks a few months ago. Stay in your lane. About staying in your lane and how Stay important that is. I guess for a couple of reasons. One, you're developing the skills and the ability to speak well into that area. But uh, it is true. I, I said this with someone recently about how it's like we have this idea that, well, people get very upset, say Bishop Robert Barron for something. Yeah, They'll say, it's almost like we're saying because he's not the answer to everything, he can't be the answer to anything. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Same thing with life team. Mm -hmm. Well, because they can't solve this and they have this problem, therefore... You know, and so it's almost like we're looking for the one body part, yeah. And we all have to then be it. Yes. We all have to be Michael Voris, or we it. all have to be Christopher West, or, mm -hmm. or whoever. And it's probably this. It's probably long standing, but there's something about our modern culture here that that we have to be uh, attentive to, to both utilize you know the good, mm -hmm. but also be attentive to see the bad and how it's influencing us. Right? There's a there's a need to to not just provide some objective truth there's a need to slam there's a need to to undoubtedly win an argument when you say need like, what do you mean like a desire like a well, raw I mean, desire you got 140 characters dude yeah. you got if you yeah. start doing that one slash two slash three, i mean you start doing all that that's that's yeah. okay yeah, yeah, yeah you know but the point is you don't just provide a point for dialogue you've got to have you know you got to destroy yeah and that's part of the broader culture yeah that when we start using these same tools we're swept up into it too Right. You know, we have a certain, and I consider myself part of this, a nostalgia or this fear that somehow take the church, as you just mentioned, is has become something other than it ought to be. And we are in a crisis unlike ever before. Mm. And I, in my brief history, I'm trying to find this time in 2000 years where the church was ever this, <laughs> was ever not in crisis. Mm. And I'm not trying to do a false equalization. I'm just mm. saying, where has there the has church never been ever an been? Period. No, yeah. and there's always been something that could and should have destroyed the church. Maybe it felt like <laughs> maybe it felt like there was this like security that came along when we had John Paul and Benedict because we saw the craziness, we experienced the craziness, and now we've got like a guy who's on our side, and it just felt like up and up. Do you think maybe that's what happened? Got spot on. I think you're spot yeah. on because I know that's me personally. You know, I grew up, John Paul II was the only pope I've ever known, yeah. you know, up until 2005. So it was jolting. And I remember the jolting sense of when he died. It was jolting when he was ill and not as vibrant as he was for this, you know, six, seven years before then. And to see him, you know, publicly uh, become less and less 
the vibrant mm -hmm. father that he was to me in terms of faith and everything else and and stalwart yeah um uh it was a huge relief at least maybe a temporary one to get ratzinger who right. of all the people in the universe uh that i read more than you know than yeah. john paul ii would have been would have been ratzinger right. so there was another certainty right, right. Because it was like, and, and I keep going back to this, Cal Keating wrote a book called The Francis Feud. Hmm. And Cal was my boss at Catholic Answers, and I think he's a really gifted writer. I was like reading him, mm -hmm. and he said, it, it used to be that we looked to Rome to clarify the confusion of our parishes, and now we're looking to <laughs> our Orthodox parishes to clarify the confusion coming out of Rome. Good point. I think that's spot on. Good point. Good and that's point. not even a... That's not even a swipe. Well, I guess it is it's a an swipe. observation. It's a swipe of Pope Francis. It is, but but, it, but it's to say, like, even if he's not saying something altogether wrong, he's saying a lot of things that are very confusing, and we just we're like, where do we stand again on this? And there's a lot of confusion at the exact same point that there's a ton of confusion in society. True. So, and I think it's George Weigel who talks about evangelical Catholicism, and he talks about how, you know, we're living in a in a shift more broadly that um, we're used to mm. a Christian culture. We're used to, even with the, the brokenness and the wars, yeah. we're used to sort of a, a, a firm sense that civil law, yeah. civil expectations, right? Cultural expectations were always measured by yeah. authentic Christian and Catholic yeah. you know, sensibilities. And they're no longer. Yeah. So we're, we're we've been in this slow decline mm. already. This slouching to Gomorrah, toward Gomorrah, Ooh, using another slouching phrase. Slouching towards Gomorrah. Yeah. Okay. I now borrowed that. New book. The Arnado, and that's it's already taken. It's already oh, is taken. It? Um, it's good. And I'm trying to remember who that was. Your, your viewers will remind us. Yeah. But um, slouching toward Gomorrah Whew, is um, that is spot on. Is happening here. And um, I was thinking Scalia, but I think somebody else had used that phrase. Maybe it was Justice Scalia. But um, so he pointed this out even before another sort of north star of our of the pope being the the you know the guardian of, of doctrine. Mm -hmm. But I wonder how much of that existed before John Paul II. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was certainly Rome. We looked yep. to Rome. We certainly looked to the Vatican. We looked to the congregations. We looked right. to you know, the, the seat of Peter for sure for for the millennia. Yeah. But to a particular. Pope? Like ultramontanism kind of things, what you're talking about? Like we're looking too much to Pope? No, I, just, I think he, I think he, he, I think he was trustworthy. I, I consider I think he trustworthy. trustworthy too, but that's so. precisely why we said we give you everything. <laughs> yeah. Because you're trustworthy and things are in chaos. Exactly. We will look to you and make you everything. Yeah, and nobody, it, this is a bell curve, right? So there were always those who were, yep. you know, John Paul II was traveling too much. He was doing too much yep. know, with the modernists and with the other religions. And yep. so it was always bell curve. I'm talking sort of center of the, the mass description of what a Catholic associated with orthodoxy, uh, being Catholic, identity, the relationship, the universal church, parish, I mean, all the dynamism, dynamics there. Yeah. And I think, yeah, for, for you know, decades, mm -hmm. we had a, we had the most popular man on the earth. That's right. Who was our Pope. Well, Mother Teresa was his wingman. <laughs> exactly. She was the most popular lady. Exactly. So it became more borrowed culture. It wasn't. I mean, you look at the the, 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 the the popes in the previous times on the litter, and once in a while you get a picture of them. Mm -hmm. People don't know what they look like. Yeah. Right? You might get the poster in your parish, but you don't know what the pope looks like. And much so it, less what he's tweeting about or what exactly. he said about plastic in the ocean or and something. And they didn't write books. Yeah. John Paul II yes. was the first. He was yes. told in the beginning that popes don't write books. Or take interviews. Or take interviews. Yeah. Right, all of that was done through the system. Mm -hmm. So again, we're not being nostalgic, saying we got to go back. That's that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. But just be respectful of the pivot, and the respect of the pivot says, what is the center of respect mass? The pivot. Respect the pivot, man. <laughs> the pivot is, I was here, and now you're pulling me here. Yeah. So what does it take for Damon and for Matt? What does it take for us to live on authentic? Call to oh, holiness, Lord. amen. In this world, right now, in and, my and, lane, and look, you know, I've been holding patch. on to this. I've been holding on to John Paul the Soul, John Paul the Second, probably too unhealthily, mm -hmm. and I've, I've lost him to a certain extent. And 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 Benedict and, and Ratzinger have held on when I wanted to get yep. something answered because I'm asking the questions. He can answer questions in a way like nobody can. We were also given a bit of a narrative regarding our church that made us. Um, convinced that we were in the right church. Now, I am convinced that I'm part of the church Christ established, but there's a confidence that's been shaken in mm. me and in many people. Mm. Um, so, you know, I came into the church in 2000 mm -hmm. in Rome, World Youth Day, and I was told a story. And I think that story was 
largely correct, you know? It's, so it's like even before John Paul, you got Pope Paul VI, who talked about contraception when every, you know, when every other Protestant church turned away. Oh, wow, and then John Paul and then Benedict. And it's almost like we were told a narrative, like the world's fallen apart, but you've got the church. And, and all of this is still true today. Mm -hmm but it just doesn't feel as true. It mm. just feels it's as confusing here in the church as it was out there. Mm. Don't you think? Most people are like, okay, it's confusing as crap outside, but I'm inside in the church. See, I, I think, and I wouldn't project this, this onto anybody, but as, as, as God is my witness, um, I have never been scandalized in my faith. I, I've never what had- What do you mean? I, in the sense of, I've, my faith has never been shaken by, you know, the priest in my community right. who ended up being a molester of three of my classmates, two of them committed, killed themselves, right? This happened? Well, this happened. Oh, this God. in your life? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. My high school friends, absolutely. God, I'm mercy. I've been scandalized by, you know, a, a childhood priest friend who... Now, what do you mean? Because you were scandalized. Sc I'm, I'm on, in, in it the just formal hasn't sense. shook your faith. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean by scandal. It hasn't yeah. drawn me away from mm -hmm. the truth. It hasn't hasn't shaken my ability to think, this is the church is, this is who I am. Yeah. I respect that. And I'm not saying that as some virtue signaling, like you shouldn't feel that way. I'm really not. I'm trying to understand how what people the, are at. the failure of uh, a pastor, the misunderstanding of a doctrine or the wishing that a doctrine was not there yeah. or finding someone else in terms of camps. How does that change your faith in your relationship with Jesus Christ? I, I don't know that. I, don't, mm. I haven't experienced that. But I know, like you said, I've in ministry 25 years. I see it all the time. Well, I'm just I saying that my approach to it is not one like been there, done that, here's sure. what you do. Mine is more like, no, God is. Yeah. Yesterday, today, and the church yeah. is. If the church were about the priests and the nuns and the structure and, yep. the, and the Vatican offices, we would have been done 1,500 years ago. Yeah, we no, wouldn't have survived right. Ephesus. Or I mean, the crucifixion. Or, yeah. We wouldn't have survived all, any of that. Yeah. So something else is going on here. No, that's right. And I think for many people who are invested in the Catholic Church, they've had a real conversion to Christ. They have a dynamic relationship with Him. They pray. They read the saints. I agree that I think for these people, if they, if me and you and others continue on this path of trying to grow in holiness, that a bad pope or a scandalous priest or some other scandal is not going to be the thing that pulls us no, out of the church. it'll be sad. It'll make you angry. Yeah. It'll make, all the emotions will but be But I think what, what might happen, and this is me projecting, I don't know, but I, I would imagine like if I'm having a crisis of faith, you know, and I'm like, hey, maybe God doesn't exist. This is just something I tell myself. And I believed it when I was 17. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. What did I know? And I yep. just went along with it. Um, and then if I start seeing the, I'm like, I don't want to be associated with this. Or it might be like a moral thing, right? So I get a divorce or um, I'm committing adultery or I am living in a same-sex relationship. And I'm just like trying to reconcile this yes. behavior. And then I see, then I see the confusion, maybe that's when it starts to pull me out. I've seen all, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then that, there can be a genuine pastoral concern that, um, you know, um, and, and that's where I want to make maybe, maybe a distinction, right? A genuine pastoral concern with sort of uh, a watch, watchman on the wall, making sure that we don't slide into another heresy, right? Yeah. Because the heresies come and go, come and go, and most of them come back, right? Mm -hmm. So from a doctrinal view, many I've seen take this position of being watchmen on the wall that say, well, if you, that statement was a little imprecise. Yes, yes. And if you follow that logically, yes, yes. all of a sudden you're going to find yourself an Arian, right? right? You right. know, an Albigensian with this. So, and that kind of you know, eye roll because I'm more pastoral work. Yeah. And we need watchmen, yep. um, but that's not me. So I don't, I don't, have much sensitivity to that because mm -hmm. for other reasons, but for the pastoral side, there's another danger that uh, the people will hear what they want to hear. And if I were not, again, I don't want to be misunderstood in terms of, of uh, you know, I've got answers here as I don't, I'm just trying to look in my own heart. Why don't I get outraged mm -hmm. when I see these things? And I think the times that I do get outraged are when I think, three steps down the line, what's gonna happen? If somebody said this and somebody wanted to hear that, they're gonna interpret that as mm -hmm. justification for continuing to live and sort of saying, my conscience yeah. be my guide. Yeah. And then they're gonna do this and then the whole thing is just gonna to go to pot, right? And it's sort of this, 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 this slippery slope thing. But what has saved me, I think, from really entering into that, into a despairing, is because I do pastor work. Mm. Because I'm with, I'm with couples, I'm with people struggling with their sexuality, with um, marriage, yeah. with real practical things. So I don't worry about what might happen. I'm actually doing the work. Ah. I'm there to say, yeah, this is what that actually meant. Gotcha. So if I didn't have that outlet, if I didn't have that evangelical encounter, yep. and I was uh, 
and I was, I was rooted in what the church teaches, objectively deducting principle, then, you know, I, I'm at ease because yeah. I could look at you and I say, no, that's not what that means. And you know that doesn't, you know that doesn't mean right. that. So I'm not worried about, oh my gosh, somebody's going to hear Pope Francis or they're going to hear Father James Martin and they're going to think the church has changed and now everything's going to go to pot. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't go very far with that because I've got an appointment you know, with someone, I'm, I'm going to do a pre cana I'm going to yeah. do a marriage seminar. So I get up and I say, you know, we're hearing this, 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 and this. Let's unpack this. Yeah. This is what this means. And people go, oh. Mm. But if I weren't doing pastoral work, I'd be wringing my hands. I, I'd probably have a blue check on my on my Twitter handle also because I would be using that as an outlet <laughs> to make sure that this bulwark against all yeah. this heresy doesn't get any further than me. And, and I, you know, if. And as, as we've said, like, we're glad people are doing that. There's people We're that are not all called to do that. And people are doing it that aren't called to do it, but oh, there are people that, that are called to do it. Who are doing it, yeah. So it's it's not me to judge who it is, but yeah. you, you read some of these feeds and you're like, you're not really, you know, you're more defending the it than you're encountering the I, right? And and every one of these has an extreme. I was just in a little Twitter spat this morning with you? one of uh, Tell us about my that. rare ones. Well, <laughs> it was, I, I don't want to blow it more than it is because it wasn't worth it, but sure. it was a, it was a retweet of, of Father Martin, uh, James Martin, about a Dutch uh, theologian, Je Jesuit theologian, who commented that the church needs to stop using the phrase gender ideology because it's alienating baptized Catholic, LGBT Catholics. Mm. And it was a Twitter thing, so it's only, you know, so he had the article. So this is a theologian tweeting this? Correct. Okay. And then Father Martin retweeted it, which then went to the millions, and then, you know, I, oh. I read his original. I went back, it was in Dutch, got the English, read it, came back and just commented, and I said, you know, flaccid opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, what do you call the ideas and ideals of someone uh, claiming to know what gender is. It, 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 it was basically just, I was trying to stay cool, but just saying gender ideology is not a disparaging, mm -hmm. in, objectively disparaging term. It's mm -hmm. way you encompass a set of ideas and ideals, and particularly with gender, that are directly aggressively being used to change our understanding of gender. Mm -hmm. So this is, the, the body of ideas is an, is an ideology. Yeah. So his point was that you, you, you're sitting across from someone and you're immediately associating a real person with an ideology. Mm. And I say, you know, that, that is unjust. Mm. We should wait until they actually express the heresy and then call it a gender mm -hmm. ideology, yeah. right? They call you out on it. They call you out on it, yeah. you know, point taken. So my point is, yeah. even in that forum, there's no real satisfaction mm. I don't, in, in doing that as much as, and I, and I checked myself because it was like, hey, good one, Damon, you gotta, you know, yeah. gotta go on, you know? Yeah. And then the hardest thing in the world is letting, you know, letting some ridiculous statement just kind of go un, unresponded well, to. This is why, <laughs> this is why someone runs my social media now. Yeah. Uh, I don't run it, I don't have the passwords to it. I, I love it. I would be in so much trouble. Yeah. So much trouble. And my day would be a lot more stressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder, like, you know, you, you wonder, like, how many people, did Paul preach the gospel to? Like, how, like, I'm sure there's a number. God knows it. So, like, what is that number? Uh, how many people did Jesus proclaim the gospel mm. to? There's a number. You and I have reached more people mm. directly than mm. Jesus Christ did. Scary. Oh, at least in his th three-year yeah. ministry directly. Frightening, but probably true. Yeah. And I wonder if um, that's kind of given us a false sense of how effective we ought to be. Mm. In other words, there might be someone watching this and they're like, I don't have social media and I just chat with the people in my parish. It's, that's that's good. More than good. More than good. And you <laughs> and, and I wonder if sometimes we think, well, I'm not doing enough because really I should have 100,000 subscribers. And wow. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, I do. I do. It's a poison. It's a poison. Man. And, and like we talk about the negative effects of the 24-hour news feed. Mm. And now we have that in the church as a 24-hour news feed on all these different things. And yeah, it's almost like we're neglecting the good of our relationship with Christ and our neighbors and parishioners for something seemingly more important. It's like the father who doesn't engage with his children or wife while she's serving them because he's in the important, uh, he's reading the newspaper, doing something much more important, right? He's put his, put his arms around the world, but he hasn't looked at his son today. Mm. And it can feel more important mm. to know what's happening than to get down on the level with my kid and wrestle him. And I wonder if in some weird sense in the church, it's kind of like that too. I think there's a danger of it. I don't know that I would put it out of, out of proportion. I think in our world, um, the danger is real. And there's a phrase, again, I'm so terrible with attribution, but it was, you know, how we lit, light up the streets and our house kept dark. 
Mm. You know, have we lit all the street lamps, but then left our house in the dark? Mm. So in other words, you know, it's it's a it's a dual vocation, but there's still a hierarchy. There's still a sacred order, mm -hmm. and the sacred order is the first vocation is our wife. Yeah. Right. And then our kids. That's the that's the one that will be measured on. And then some of us are called to do some extra public yeah. ministry and work within a certain sphere and to do that and to stay in our lane. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we get confused in thinking that that is evangelism, that the that the public work that we do is evangelism, that's when we start to start the measuring and the numbers you were talking about, yeah. the impact. And there's some people that are, that are doing, I've met them, that are doing uh, what I consider much more valuable work at the parish yeah. level and their you know local ministries than some of these national work you know that I do these mm -hmm. big conferences and everybody's like, oh my gosh I want to be just like you. I want to go to the I want to speak I want to be a cop. and you know ten years ago or fifteen years ago it would have been like yeah hey, well, you know let me show you what you can you know mm -hmm. now I'm like no you don't mm -hmm. I was like if you if you're called if God's calling you this pray you know that He takes it away but you'll do His will mm -hmm. because it has been you know, such a painful, and we've talked a little bit about this, just the, you know, balancing or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the prioritizing yeah. of, you know, supporting our families with something we know we've been called to do, and yet making sure that our first apostolate, our wives and our, and our kids are, are, are front, and honor, center. front and center and honored. Could you tell me a time in your marriage where that, like maybe even in ministry, where there have been times where you put ministry ahead of your family and how you recognize oh that my and gosh. what you did? Oh my gosh, I'm still reaping the wounds from that. And it's still, there's still some disorder there, but I, I did remember at the World Meeting of Families, I did a, my panel talk was on work family balance, mm -hmm. right? And I was just rolling my eyes like. <laughs> Especially when you told your wife. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Not, not even, balance. it was like one of those witness stories like, yeah, like first of all, there's no such thing as balance. Let's just get rid of that paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. There is no balance. This is Damon's opinion, right? That balance is is sort of the, um, the, the way we described the, um, you know, the center of mass. And sometimes we tip over to this side, like we're riding the bike, so we adjust to come back. And then we might go too far on this side, and then we adjust to go back. But it's dynamic, yeah. right? And if we didn't have this center of mass, if we didn't have that north star, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't know when we're off course. Mm -hmm. But to say that I'm always on course, or that I'm perfectly balanced is an illusion, right? Mm. So we need to expect to be off balance, oh, like yeah. but then be grateful to know in what direction are we out of balance. Yeah. So in, in my, my marriage, it was the first, oh my gosh, the first 10 years. Um, well, again, it took a little bit about it in the beginning, right? So I came out of a corporate environment, mm -hmm. you know, make a quarter million dollars a year. I wow. mean, prestige, big company, yeah. you know, masters, great schools. I mean, just, it was an identity. It just yep. creeped into this whole identity. So when I came full time, I had sold my, my ownership of this engineering company, had a big chunk of money mm. and didn't know how to manage money. We had, I think, we're pregnant with our fourth, third or fourth daughter at the yeah. time, right? So family's growing, young, and I still have this whole American, Northeast, I deserves, okay. the deserves, just, you know, I got this level of income, this, I deserve this kind of car, I deserve mm -hmm. this house to build this house, I deserve all of that. And when I, that was right in the time where I sold it and went into full-time ministry. So I had no models, no expectation, just thinking, I'll start another company. It's like starting any company. I know how to start companies. I've done secular, I've done these, I'll start another company. And the whole heart change of what it means to be in ministry, and it's all the, it's all the click words, it's all the words that actually mean something when you're doing it, yep. like a, a, a real poverty, a spirit of poverty, not financial poverty, but of, of comfortable in the lack, mm -hmm. you know, of looking, checking your expectations to see, you know, do I have some deserves here in my heart that are making me envious of somebody else's watch or car or, you know, lifestyle? Do I still think that I deserve a certain lifestyle? I mean, those, that's the real spirit of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have, I was, I was, I spent this thing, well, I'll just build another yeah. ministry and business and here's the revenue I need. Here's yeah. I need to support the family and boom. Yeah. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. So I took that same out of order corporate okay. build Broad and applied it to the ministry. I literally built a basement in my house that was basically an office. It was an entertainment area, a place yeah. I could bring couples in, an NFP, yeah. I could do blah, 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 and but no kids. 
because yeah. they're gonna mastically popcorn over here. Totally. They're gonna they're gonna make <laughs> yeah. noise. Yeah. So when I close this door, you know these little kids are supposed to know they tiptoe yeah. around the house because yeah. daddy's downstairs doing God's work. <laughs> you know, yes, you shut up. <laughs> you shut up, right? And the stuff it was just this whole. I'm gonna revolutionize this. You know, all these people that go into ministry have no idea how to run business. So I'm gonna come in with my business acumen and I'm gonna show them how to do it. And mm-hmm. and what had happened then, and then you know things started to grow. So as the kids, the girls started to get older, they started to see you know, the recognition. They started to see the work I was doing. They started to you know, understand the people that were being impacted by the theology of the body and about natural family planning and these real things. And they'd stop in the supermarket. Thank you so much for yeah. your talk. It was so, you know, yeah. and they goes, who was that daddy? I said, like, don't worry about it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And they actually get used to it. Yeah. So what it did is it caused this great rift in their hearts. Really? That daddy was really out doing other stuff and that um, I miss him, and but I can't really say anything because he's out doing such good stuff. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Now, and all this didn't come out until 14 years later. This is yeah. 2015 when my older girls now and just being able to to share. Well, because they're probably at an age where they can articulate it. Exactly. Like as kids, they could. Exactly. Exactly. But now articulating the wound of that lack of those years of me putting so much, whether it's traveling. And there was, there was a year I did something like a hundred and 110 talks in a year. I mean, it was, oh my goodness, it was yeah. awful. But then part of it was I had to do that because I had a mortgage. Yeah. I had, you know, you I was just I, hustling. Out of a corporate job. Exactly. Yeah. People know who I am. I got to get my name out there. Yeah, I got yeah, this yeah, talk. Yeah. I'll just add another word on it. Don't you understand? Be gone. Yeah. Exactly. There's yeah. all that whole out of balance, out of order, but so, now for God. So yeah. now it puts this conflict with them about, but you weren't here for this. Mm. When you do come home, you're tired. I'm grumpy. You know, no, I don't feel like this. And why is the house a mess? Yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're, you know, I'm out doing all this and this, you know, all that creeps in. Yeah. And that was the first 10, 12 years in ministry. And it made me physically sick. Yeah. Uh, it made, um, their wounds in, in at least two of my daughters now that we're still dealing with right now. So this is very personal. God bless to me. you for your vulnerability. That's that's tough to face. Well, it's reality, right? And it, and it would be dishonest to you know work so intimately with couples and families. Yeah. And to shield somehow. No, that's from good. The, so there's something I believe, Matt. I believe in my heart that the mistakes, the hurt that I've had with, to Melanie and to the girls and all these. And, you know, whatever we're dealing with in our family, whatever, this is our mess. But God is in this. I really believe this. He's in this. And he wants us not to fix it so that we can be good Christians. He wants us to be able to take the mess, the dung, and to give it back to him. You know, like a little kid with a mud pie. And be like, Dad, I made you a mud pie. What does that look like then? (sighs) Because sometimes that doesn't sound any different, right? If you have the mess and you're saying, we don't have to fix it. And then give it to God. We have to give it to God, but isn't give it to God the way in which we fix it? It or? is. But notice the, the 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 steps there, and and I and I use the um, the phrasing of, of of liturgy. You know, Dr. Greg Popchak talks about this in in a lot of his family and marriage books about the liturgy in the family. And we even talked about this at a recent conference at Notre Dame Catholic Family Life Symposium, which is going to be publishing some things in the fall. That this liturgy of the family is about respecting and even nurturing what you'd call an authentic family spirituality. Mm, as opposed to what? Imposing as opposed something to, alien upon it? Mona- a, mon- a monasticism, right? We have a romantic, especially if we, we get more vibrant, it's like, you know what, God, it. we're not just going to pray the rosary tonight. We, we should be on our knees. Yeah. You know, we should, um, you know, have all the images down the hallway. And I'm not mocking. I'm just saying when we think about being vibrant, vital Christian families. We don't what do we do? Of mess. We think of when we I, think of the we think of the, the, the monastery. We think we of the are, convent. Yeah. And we say, how can we model that and, and in the house? Like, it's, it's like a convent, um, and then just trying to deal with the kids. So that and they, they're always in the way. They don't have to interrupt the convent lifestyle that I now want. They're not paying attention. To I just want a convent and sex. <laughs> That's what I want. Just, um, no, I remember when I first got married, I would get really angry with Cameron and my kids because I envisioned praying the rosary way different to how it ended up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it, and I, I hope people resonate so I don't feel so alone here, honestly. But like I remember I was just like in my head, I had this idea of how Scott Hahn prayed the rosary with his family or how Jason Everett did. And and whereas me, you know, I'm like, hey, shut, stop it. <laughs> 
Let me get to look. He had to look. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is looking at them while you're doing it. But I think, like, I I wish I had known that it was okay. You know, that like being interrupted in the rosary, and you don't have to kneel. Just it's all right. Let's just let's just do this. Yeah. But you do you see people in their um their zeal to have a holy family, are uh, forcing things upon their family maybe that. Yeah, with, can, with, can. Good, with good intentions. Yeah. I mean, this is the, this is the world. This is the, we did too. I mean, this is how we built it. And good things come out of it. So you think, well, if we do more of it, then we'll get more good things. But what about the frustrations the frustration. we have? What about the kids? To me, this is the metric. This is the, me- the measure is, what about the kids who know everything about the faith, but, oh, it sounds so awful. Do it. Do they know Jesus Christ? Yeah. You know, the whole meltdown in college that I had, literally within the first 48 hours of college, was from a house that I grew up in that that practiced the faith. You, you look at our house, really? and we weren't uber, yeah. we weren't super Catholic in, in any sense, okay. but we were we were practicing and we were faithful Catholics. Yep. And but my encounter had always been around the stuff, you know, the, the morality and about the liturgy and about the things you do in order to be Catholic. Yep as opposed to this real vibrant personal relationship with Christ yeah. that is about taking the mess and saying, God, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. This daughter that you sent me yeah. is driving me crazy and or she's in danger and I don't know what to do. I said what I thought I was going to say and it made her matter. I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Lord, help me. That's what, that's what an offering looks like. Yep. And as opposed to, you know, you're not acting the way that a Christian child should act. Right. You know, get your stuff together. Let's get you to, let's get you to confession. <sighs> And then we'll, now we do this, <laughs> we go every, you know, on Saturday, we'll go to confession. Good. But the idea that that would be the means to which we draw our children to Christ is where you start to see this, it doesn't, it doesn't pan out that way. It doesn't happen did that you, way. Did you um, parent in a way back in the day with some of your older kids in the Catholic sense that you've now changed? Yeah. And do you see your younger kids receiving it better? Does that make sense? Like were you a hard yeah, ass on the beginning? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wish Melanie were here. Um, really? You know, we were very intentional and still are very intentional with the home. We homeschool and yeah. it wasn't just the homeschooling. It was about, you know, really making the home education, being a son or daughter. The whole thing was, it's just, just was integrated. There was a, you know, a naturalness with all of it. Mm. And we introduced a lot of those monastic, you know, whether it's the rosary, the divine mercy yeah. chaplet or, you know, seasonal, you know, flags, depending on the saints of the days. Yeah. And, the, and we did all this stuff. And That's it was cool. and, and it was very cool. It was yeah. better than any, Melanie and I had ever grown up. But did you, you know, love doing it or did we it did. stress you all out? We loved doing it. Well, that's it. the question. But see, what I think what happens is you, you run headlong into both immediately the temperament of your children mm-hmm. and more importantly, the 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 temperament of your children meeting your temperament. Mm. So right, that's that's the immediate. So when you have kids that th- can finish your sentences, that you just comfortable being around, yep. that you just you, the kids. That's funny, this, I took that in a negative way. I hate when my kids. I'm like, would you just listen? <laughs> you don't always know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> it's like, that meant in the good way. Like you know, there's yeah, some of our kids that we think alike, we feel alike. You, you, we, I get you. I yeah. get you. And then some kids are like, I don't get you. I don't understand yeah. why that made you mad. Yeah. I don't understand why that even delighted you. Why are you laughing? Yeah. You know, it, that kind of discount. So in the immediate sense, even when they're younger, you have this constant battle or you have this constant ease. Yeah. And as young parents, you think that that's the measure of what you're doing is right or wrong. Ooh. Boom, right? So if your kids that's are similar temperament and girls, introvert, like you know, delightful, read. like love to read. Yep. All of a sudden, like we had, we had six <laughs> kids sitting in line with Little House on the Prairie books, literally with bonnets oh. that would put backpacks on and follow us to three pre canes a weekend. And they would come in Amazing. as we're doing the NFP talk in in form. Bop, yes. bop, 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 bop. I bet you let these are my children. These are my kids. Look what we're doing. You can do it too, right? Yeah. But something else happens. We 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 have now kids who uh, we have very different temperaments. So the stuff that was so easy with some of the younger ones earlier yeah. on, now we've gotten ones and they're like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Why do I do that? <laughs> what, what, what? I don't know. <laughs> I had a friend up in Canada <laughs> and her first two children were incredibly intelligent, introverted, soft-spoken. Um, they would, the first kid learned, taught himself to read when he was like three or four. Yeah, we had two of those. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so this couple, yeah, this couple would give advice like to other friends about you just need to be doing this. And they did it out of a place of love. Of course. But the third child came along and he was a <laughs> rascal. 
<laughs> an absolute rascal. And they actually went back to these families and said, please I'm forgive sorry. us. <laughs> please forgive us. That's what I mean. Because they realized it really was, it had more to do with genetics than their parents. And that's my point. So that's the temperaments tell you immediately, you know, they give you a false sense of either insecurity or a false sense of security that what you're doing. As they get older, then they really start, especially age of reason, you know, seven, eight, and then older, they start to really express themselves as unique, unrepeatable people. And, mm. it's, and that's what really drives us crazy. They're, they're, not, they're not us. They're not these little forms of clay that we're building. <sighs> that these, make us look good. They make us look good or bad. Yeah, my, or my, bad. My, well, my point was, <laughs> They are not simply an extension of myself to make me feel like a good father. Yes, yes. Yeah, they're, they're their own person. But I throw that other side because I hear that just as often to make you a bad father, right? They're not, what they do is not in any way the measure of who you are. So they do things that you don't understand. They make it embarrass you in public. Yes. That you would do, and you're thinking, I must be doing something wrong. Oh, I, I, need, to I need to read a psychology book on parenting because I'm yeah. doing something wrong. It's the flip side of the coin. This is really good advice for parents. There's a lot of shame. I, I had priests That's who say to me that they have so many mothers who hate themselves mm, and have mm, so much guilt mm. about how they're raising their kids and how they're managing the home and how they're attending to their husband. And I'm sure, no doubt dads have the same kind of shame. We do. And, I, and to add to that, the, the parenting shame, it's been a marvel revelation epiphany for me in these last few years, is directly related to the marriage. Okay. They're, they're inseparable. How so? Well, it, it turns out that there's something, you know, ontological, there's something relational about being, the human being, that the marriage, we talk about marriage being this communion of persons, using our theology language, right? Bone on bone, flesh of flesh, and the grace of sacramental marriage flowing into the family. It's deeply and cosmologically true. So our ability to mother women, our ability to uh, father men mm -hmm. uh, is, is, an outflow of our marriage. Okay. So, and when our marriage is going well and we're we're connected, we're on the same page, we're, you know, um, affirming, we're uh, with a sense of presence to one another. Yep. There's a real love. There's an ease that happens even in difficult parenting really? because there's a there's a there's a coalescence together, right? Hmm. And not in a romantic way, but in a very, very deeply intimate personal way, that your raising of this child is not a task as much as it is this this outflow of our of our marriages. Yeah. And in the negative sense, that when marriages is, is tough, when it's either dry, cold, mm -hmm. when there's separation, when there's doubt, there's fears that become, and there's just tension, anxiety. And we go through these seasons all the time, right? But when that, it becomes very difficult to, to mother. It becomes very difficult to father. We can do it. We can get the, the transactional things down. And, and why is that? As a, don't put, uh, without pointing I, to like kind of some mystical sounding language. Sure, like sure, what, sure. What is it? Is there something actually that's going on? I think it's, it's, um, it's a divine confidence. It's in, uh, it, when we know that we are lovable, I'm worthy to be loved for yeah. who I am. Ooh. I am, just for who I am. Good, yeah. bad, and ugly, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes my breath stinks, sometimes I talk yeah. too much, sometimes I, but it's me. Yeah. I'm worthy to be loved for who I am. Yep. That's a, and that's you a take, deeply you integrated. you from your bride. Is that what you're talking about? Like when you receive that? Obviously well, from you, the father first, but. Yeah, well, ideally it's what we bring into the marriage because now we're, we're, operate, we're operating in, in this ability to give and receive ourselves integrated to another, right? Mm -hmm. But most of us enter into marriage with enough of a brokenness and the, and the disintegration within us that we do look to our husband so. and our wives to continue that that integration, to continue that feeling. We look to each other, that's what the gaze is. Yeah. We look to one another, he said, do you see me? Yeah. You know, do you, do you, and if you do see me, do you like me? Do you, do you adore me? Do you, yeah. you know, need me? And that, that ability to be irreplaceable to someone uh, and then the vulnerability okay. with that. So what, is that what you're saying? So like in a marriage, if I feel that from my wife and I'm you know, in, a, in a real healthy way, I'm present to her, she's present to me, I'm loving on her, she's loving on me, I'm safe in yes. my relationship with her then I have more freedom to parent Well, there's my two children. questions that get answered, yes. And the first of that freedom is, I'm worthy to be loved for who I am. Yeah. And the second is that others are willing and capable of fulfilling my needs. Yes. Now there's a four box matrix here, Bloody, right? Yeah. Four blocks matrix of yes, no, yes, no, of whether you're worthy to be loved for who you are, okay. yes or no, and whether others are willing and capable of fulfilling your needs, yes or no. We look for this from our mothers and fathers growing up as part of our affective formation as people. Oh. 
So by the time we enter the vocation of either the priesthood of religious life or marriage, we enter into it, we're making, making a pledge in response to that call to be wholly integrated with another. But because we're broken before then, this is happening with our priests, it's happening with our religious, it's happening with every human person, mm -hmm. that we look in the vocation to continue that, that healing information. You couple that with this deep sensuality of what it means to be human, that it's not enough to say God loves me and that I know he loves me. I need to see it, I need to smell it, I need to taste it, I need to touch it, I need to be touched, I need, I need affection, I need my senses to confirm that I'm worthy to be loved for who I am I and my senses to confirm that others are even willing and capable yeah. of fulfilling my needs. So you get a no-no in that, in those questions, how are you gonna turn to your son or daughter? But what you'll do is you'll <laughs> turn to them to integrate you. Does that make sense? Oh, so yes. if, if my bride won't love me and accept me for who I am, then I'll look for affirmation from my kids. And if they're playing up, um, then I take that as a direct kind of insult to who I am. Mm -hmm. Or the messy house, the messy or house. the talk back, or the rolling of the eyes, or all the things that kids do and not listening, not following through. Instead of saying, this child has been given to me, it's a the gift. question, that's what it is. We're bringing the question mm -hmm. of who am I and am I lovable? We, we bring it around to every kind of thing. You know, we every relationship. First and foremost in the father, but I like what you said, mm -hmm. it needs to be in flesh, and so I bring it to my wife. Um, but she cannot do that. She cannot answer she that can't. primarily or else she I'll can't. kill her and I'll say I married the wrong person. Exactly. And I needed someone who was more like this or more like that. But if I'm not getting it from her, I bring it to my son and my daughter and, and in all sorts of ways. Like you wanna go out like fishing this weekend or should we go to the trampoline park? And No, I am not. I, and it becomes about me and I feel hurt and so I become angry. That's one avenue. Now, okay. zooming out, there's a whole matrix of all of those responses, negative or positive, given those two questions. The wonderful book I'm, I'm thinking through here and talking through is called Attachments. And it's by an evangelical author, a therapist, and he talks through for each of these boxes. Yes, I'm worthy to be loved. Yes, others like are willing and capable. No, yes, yes, no, yes. All the, the four boxes, there are particular expressions of the def defect in right? each of those. A workaholism. Working too much is a sign of others not willing exactly to love it, right? Or I'm not worthy to be loved, so I'm gonna keep working and you're gonna love what I do and I'm gonna get the attention, I'm gonna get the affirmation, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get the, so our, our expression is a full circle, is, it, is how we act is in accord with who we think we are. Mm -hmm. We're back to that again. So how I act as a father is directly proportional to who do I think I am and who do I know that I am? Mm -hmm. It's not just an intellectual exercise, it's a, right, like it's if a I'm human a, if exercise. If I'm a beloved son of God, favored by the Father, if, 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 if I'm secure in who I am, my child can be a little brat, or they can talk back, and that can be a little annoying, mm -hmm. but it's not gonna crush me, because mm -hmm. I know who I am, and I know that I'm not responsible for your behavior, you know? And there's a delight, and this is what I'm dreaming about with my kids, I, I, I wish I were there now and they need me to be here, right, for this, is to look at them and say, and see this unique, unrepeatable, unrepeatable person yeah. that never existed before, so why should it be my little mini-me? Why should, why should you be, so they act up and they do stuff, they sin, they steal, they lie, they cheat, they do all that, and you look at them and be like, that's not who you are. Yeah. Dude, let's, let's make this right, let's do this. Like As opposed to, what, what are you doing? Do. Yeah. What are you doing? You know, get back here. Look at your sister. Tell her you're sorry. Say it. Yep. Say it. Did this yesterday? Continue. Did <laughs> before yesterday, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but I'm saying these things come out because it's like you toe the line as opposed to staying in your lane. And the lane is where we recognize that we are stewards. I love this word. I really do. Yeah. There's a stewardship in our fatherhood and motherhood that says these aren't my kids in the strictest sense. These are kids that we've been gifted by God to help form them to become the men and women that God created them to be. It's the difference between the steward and the owner. And as a parent and as a father, we some we have to go back and once in a while just to check ourselves. We've got to check ourselves in saying, they're not only not a reflection of an extension of my ego or yeah. my being, but that in fact I have a, a blessed gift from God to help them become a man or a woman that God has never created before. Yeah. And there are objective, deductive, and principled truths about who we are as people, but there's also very subjective, inductive, and experiential. And what I didn't give make about that, that structure that's really important here is the logic, that deductive, inductive, it's important to recognize that there are particular truths to Matt Fred, right? And then there's universal truths to the human person. Mm -hmm. And they're not at odds. 
right. right? The universal objective lays bare perfectly within the subject, the eye of the, of the particular Matt Fradd or Damon Owens. So whether we begin with the particular and start to see the universal truths, mm -hmm. or whether we begin in the universal and see how they manifest in the particular, it's this beautiful both and, okay. right? They're not the same, but they're related in a way that even we can't see it, we have to have confidence that it actually exists. So our kids become these little people that are still in the human person. They're anthropology. You know who they are in the image and likeness of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But this one, this instantiation right here has never existed before. So the difference is gonna be a wonder, a fascination. Mm -hmm. Like who is this little critter that is driving me crazy? And right. who are you gonna become? You see the reverence? There's a reverence that comes from that stewardship as opposed to uh, a frustration of yeah. not meeting my expectation. Mm -hmm. Now, if I owned you, you're yeah. gonna do what I say and be what I do and, and I'm gonna decide it. I can create you in my own image and likeness. That's right. But to the steward. Yeah, and even, and totally from a good place, right? Like oh, if sure. I were a kid, I would have done this, I would have done is. that, and after high school, I, I would have went to university or whatever, and so you. And you, I wanna make sure you don't experience what I did in the bad, so yeah. I'm gonna make sure you, yeah, no, it's a good place. What's your advice for a new father? I get a lot of <sighs> questions from, from men who are just like, what, what do I do? What's your advice? Yeah. Um, I'm twice as old as I look and half as old as I feel. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's my little <laughs> baggins here. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> that, that came to mind. Yeah. And I like you half Haven't, as much as I mean. yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of it is still projection. You know, I've got uh, kids from 22 down to nine. I'm still in the middle of this. I got my first wedding coming up in October for my 23 year old, actually. That's beautiful. And there's a lot of what ifs, coulda, woulda, shouldas. And, yeah. and when I get that question, as you do, I try to check myself that it's not just a projection of, of my own ego. What would, I, what would I give advice to a young father? But I do know how I would talk to Damon Owens, April 25th, 1993, the day after my wedding, right? Yep. And I would have told him that um, you're not here to conquer the universe. That really everything you do in the quiet of your home in the solitude of you and Melanie, in the quiet alone time with each of the babies, um, in the things that don't get any headline, they don't get any publicity, uh, that is the cosmos. Hmm. That is the cosmos and it's worth it. It's worth it to, if you have to play the mind game, it's worth wasting time with your with your wife. It's kind of a pejorative, but yeah. because we're so thinking we're doing everything else, I've got, I want to be effective and do yeah. all these things. The young husband, father is under so much anxiety and pressure to perform. And again, I don't want to project, but that's where I was. I still am. That performance makes me worthy to be loved. Mm -hmm. It makes me worthy of affirmation. And the better I do, the more it's worth that, you know, Pope Francis gave me a medal because I did this, 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 and this as opposed to an affective, you know, I want to, I want somebody to write the book. Maybe it'll be me. Um, seven habits of highly affective families. Mm, you can't get sued that way. Hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Right. <laughs> be like, I'm, I'm Mr. McDonald. Here are my hamburgers. Right. <laughs> right. But an aff highly affective family is one that really is, um, has this beautiful interior life ad intra and an ad extra. Right? It has this communio and this missio. Like breathing, we can come together so that we can go out. Come together and we go out. And we don't have this sort of this disorder that I'm more of an exhaler than an inhaler, you know? We're, we're kind of a doing family, you know? We don't have a lot of time. Like that, yeah. Or we're really a very close family. We don't do a lot of outside stuff. We're, yes. more, of a, we're more of an inhaling family, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there's this beautiful like integration. So the father of this family is one who's constantly checking the breath to making sure that we have enough time together that we can answer without any doubt to our own hearts and to our kids, you're worthy to be loved for who you are. Not for what you do. I loved you when you came out of the womb and you were screaming. You couldn't do anything. Yeah. You haven't been able to do anything since the baby. And I've I've been willing to lay my life down for you. Yeah. I mean, from my heart. Yeah. So and then good. that experience is one that takes time. And that whole wasting time, again, mind game is instead of looking out there, that add extra, that somehow we gotta go out there and or that we have to do everything in here. 
I think fatherhood is about not just engendering life that can exist outside, but it's about ensuring their good by constantly modeling this value of, of what we have together, mm. you know, and then what we are to the world. And um, young fathers need to get off that train of accomplishment, of praise and um, public recognition and spend some real interior time. Interior, that's the word. I, I think if, I was thinking as, as you were speaking about, you know, going back to 19, when, 93? 93. I was 10 years old, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, I was if I could go back to in you know, the day before my, my son was born and give me advice, I, I'm thinking, I'm like, I wouldn't have believed any of it. Yeah. I couldn't have heard it. Yeah. So I think like the advice I would have for a young man getting married is do get get healing. Mm. Choose to be well. Mm. Get a spiritual director. Mm. Get a therapist. Work on your junk mm. now, now, because it's almost like that's what once you once you're secure in who you are as a son. And I'm gradually learning. You know, still got a long way to go. But the more I become confident in my son son sonship, uh, the more I can be calm mm -hmm. there's a rest restfulness in there yes 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 God, dude i'm so uh uptight and anxious you know and, and, and I've, I've always had that and, and i think a lot of that in my early years was being a father is just like this i'm vibrating you know like i'm not settled i'm mm -hmm. angry i'm mm -hmm. pissed off at something mm -hmm. i didn't know what to do with that mm -hmm. and i hear other parents tell me they love being a parent i'm like I don't know if I like it. <laughs> I, I, and I get that that says only bad things about me, but that's where I'm at. And I just, yeah, and, and I remember it was really troublesome for me too. I'd say to parents, hey, just so you know, like it might not be as great as you think it is. And like later on, they're like, it really was as great. I'm like, screw you. Um, I found it bloody difficult. And I, there was shame in that too. Sure. But I think it would have done me a lot of good if I had like a mentor in my life, like a man who I could meet with or even just phone up from time to time and be completely honest and real. So here's, here's the challenge, and I'm with you. I'm, I'm totally with you. This is not even a but, this is an and, is that that question alone, you know, what advice would you give to, you know, a young father? We're, we're back into the objective modes mm. because it's some young men are so afflicted that they need comfort. Some are so comfortable, they need some affliction. So the answer to that question is going to be, in terms of the balance, where are you now as that's a man? A, that's a really great point. So you give all the comfort advice. To, yeah. And you're like, yeah, You might I'm need to good. get off your ass yeah. and work harder and exactly. stop sleeping in. Exactly. But you tell it to a workaholic. That's right. And you can put gas onto a, a burning fire. So that whole subjective inductive experiential says, let's honor the real experiences of people. Let's meet them as unique, unrepeatable I subject, and let's see what's going on in their particular life that gives witness to the universal truths. Mm. So we've got the same deposit of faith as believers, and a young father is on the same trajectory of son, brother, friend, spouse, father, right? That's our, that's our path to holiness in those relationships and in through those relationships. But what does that look like is so unique and unrepeatable yeah. that even the marriage advice, the parenting advice, we can talk principles all I day long, and we it. need to. We need to. I love it. We, this is awesome. This is the this is the the stake in the ground. Yeah. But that's not your answer. That's ah. where we get our answers. So when you have a spiritual director, it's not checking the box off. It's yes. saying, you know what? Here's here's what's really going on. My my came home, house was a mess, and for some reason, I flew off the handle. I literally was in my car. And I was, I was great. overjoyed. I can't wait. I'm Do all home. the things with my kids. I'm good. Yeah. Open up the door and I step on a Lego, and and before I could even think about getting mad, I was yelling. Yeah. Father, help, what 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 is that? What do I do with that? Yeah. And we need that 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 not just checkbox of spiritual direction, of friendship and confidence, of community of other men. We need the community of men. We need half of them laughing. Like, yeah, dude, been there, right. done that. Yeah, no, because you know what that is. <laughs> When, when you have the man hear you and, and kind of laugh as you're saying, that's him saying you're good. You're good. You're, it's okay. Yeah. It's all right. Because we're afraid that something's fundamentally broken within me that cannot be healed. Other people it can be, but with me I've tried and it doesn't that's work. That's the despair. Yes. It's the despair. So it's, to have someone in your life who can see you where you are and there's no hiding and can love you in that. Yeah. That gives you the confidence to believe that you might be lovable. And if you know, if you if you believe in the depths of your heart that you're lovable and are loved, powerful, then you can be you can just relax. You're unleashed. I mean, there's a liberty, there's a freedom there that I've only had glimpses of 
in moments and I want this more. Is, this, I want more. Yeah, me too. It, this is such a simple narrative, but it's everybody's. Mm -hmm. You listen to anybody who talks about how they recovered from some kind of hell, be that alcoholism or drug addiction or whatever. It always comes back to like if you, you know, if you, if they're sober and you're treating them like an adult, just believing I'm loved and I didn't think I was lovable. If I, had to, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yes. It's like we're all looking for love. It sounds so bloody cliche. No, and that's what love looks like, right? So. That's not controversial. We're all looking for love, right? Everybody says that. Well, what's controversial is what's love. Mm. Some people say, oh, love is love. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Tautology Plays much? It. Exactly. So what is what is love actually? The opening line, and again, I'm going to blow my own horn, but I did this for a reason. Our, our good friend, Chris Cope, right? Yep. With his beautiful Cardinal Studios marketing. Yep. He sat down like with, with me and he says, Damon, what's joy to be? What does it mean to you? And I didn't He's have anything great. pithy. I didn't have yep. anything boiled down yet. And I just start talking. And we came up with this opening line of this beautiful video he produced for me. And oh, it's, it's excellent. It's a bit, right? When did we first experience love mm. and the joy that it brings? A look, That's right. a touch, I remember a this. soothing voice. Yes. Right? And you've seen this little baby who can't do anything. But in those earliest moments, we receive and understand authentic love sensually. See, smell, hear, taste, touch. It's not words. You don't, you're loved, right? Oh, oh, thank you for telling me, yeah. right? It's, it's, a, it's an encounter, it's an experience, and it's very personal, mm -hmm. it's very human. So if you begin in that origin point and then you project out about how much more can I love, it's always relational. So by the time you're a father or you're a husband, you've got such a matrix of relationships, not just your wife, which is first, with God, with each of your children, with the children with each other, with your neighbor, with your boss, with your, your pastor, with your friend. You have all of these matrix of relationships and every single one of them to their own limited ability is an occasion to not only receive love, but to give love to someone else, to be present, to see, smell, hear, taste, touch, the way we look, the way we talk, not just what we say. So, I gotta, something I've been thinking about a lot lately, I, I really wanna figure it out, so I wanna learn from you. So I think um, a big part of this, right, is, is realizing we're loved. And so we've been hurt, you know, and we say something like, well, there's no wound you have that Jesus didn't take upon himself, and so he can identify you, he can heal you, he can speak to that. What I wanna know is, um, how do I, how do we heal from wounding others? Mm. It's one thing if you're like, my dad treated me bad or my mm. mom was never around mm. and then you're like, you deal with it. But what if you're the one who's inflicting the pain? And I think as parents, many of us are aware that to some degree or another, we've all inflicted some kind of pain oh, Absolutely. on our children. How do we heal from that? Hmm. As opposed to just knowing I've been forgiven. Um, one of my favorite people in the world is Sister Miriam James. You know, well, oh, very she's well, going to yes. come on the come oh, good, on good, here good, soon. Good, yeah. good, beautiful. And uh, she's so beautiful. You know, she shares her story very openly about having been sexually abused as a child and things mm. like that. And I just think to myself, like, okay, so how does that guy who did that horrible thing to her, how does he become okay? Not okay with doing that, but like, how does he? Because we've all yeah. done stuff. Yep. And we're yep. very ashamed of it. Have you dealt with that? Are you yeah. dealing with that now as your kids get older and you see? Just beginning to. Yeah. And, and and more of that adult peer-to-peer -peer reality with, with, with my own kids. But, you know, we, we were not orphans and we're not without uh, a very large family tree in, in our family of faith. I'm talking about the saints. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, you know, these, these witness stories of, um, of forgiveness. But the story that came to me right when you were asking that was, uh, was, was the prodigal son. And I remember reading, I don't know if it's uh, Henry Nouwen and his yes, reflections on, on the prodigal book. son, right? Or, or maybe something spawned from it. Sure. It's probably in there because he's, he's genius. Was um, you know, just this scenario of what would it have been like <clears throat> for the younger brother the next day at the breakfast table? So knowing that story of the prodigal son, where he's the younger brother, not in line for the inheritance, he asks his dad, give me my inheritance. He goes off, squanders it, prostitutes food, burns it all, fast, you know, uh, famine eating the pods, whatever, and says, gee, my dad's servants are eating better than me. I'm going home, right? And I'm going to tell my dad, I've sinned against God and against man, and I've come. He's had his whole speech ready to get back in the house. But the father saw him at a distance, ran to him, put his ring on a finger, put the robe back on, that whole, with not no speeches, didn't he? Cut him off in the middle of his speech, mm -hmm. right? And he received, a mer he received a mercy. He received something so undeserved from the father that he wasn't even expecting it. And all that's part of the story in the parable, right? 
And then the angry older brother, I've done everything and all my friends, you didn't give me a goat, you didn't give me anything and I did everything just right and you yeah. didn't, right? And that whole triple story between the father and the son and they're all prodigals in their own way, right? Excessive yeah. in one way or another. But from a human view, when would have the younger son, the younger son, when would he have really felt the weight of what he inflicted on his father, on his brother? And in reflecting on that, the real sense of the woundedness and, the, and what he had done wouldn't have come until after. The and commotion of being The commotion, but also the body. receiving of such unworthy love. Of knowing in your heart. By commotion, I mean the party he threw. The party? Because that was the, it was, uh, here I am. But I like what you just said a moment ago, like the next morning at breakfast. <laughs> exactly. Where we're not still saying you're amazing and you're here and you're wonderful and we love you. No, and, you know. and but dad is looking at you just doting. And you're looking like, he has no idea what I've been doing for the last two years. Yeah. I don't deserve this. At some point, he's going to realize I'm a, you know. Yeah. So that whole sense of undeservedness. And then you start to see... Why is he treating me with such favor, knowing that I don't deserve it? So it's not justice. Justice is giving others what they're right and worthily do. Mm. Mercy is giving them more than what they're rightly do. Mm -hmm. So by definition, mercy is undeserved. So when you experience an undeserved good and you actually receive it, you experience also the unworthiness. And I think that's the answer to your question, that when you, the unworthiness makes you more attentive to the wounds that you've committed to other people. So you'll approach them and you'll approach God very differently with a real sense of, man, I am so sorry. Mm. There's nothing I can do to undo what I did to you. It's not a speech. I've sinned against God and against you, Matt. Mm. And I ask, you know, you're like, dude, I, I can't even, I don't know what I would do in your position. I don't know, but I just want you to know, I am so sorry. And I will do anything to, that I can now to mm. you know, make reparation or to do whatever I can. And, and over time, I'm not pushing anything, whatever it is, but I just, yeah, okay. I've realized what I've done. That's good. That's how you, because the question isn't, how do I receive mercy or believe I'm forgiven after I've done something horrible? The question is, now that I've received mercy, how do I heal from the wounds I know I inflicted? So, But I like that answer. I think that is the answer. And there's a balance there to that, right? So once you realize what you have inflicted, that can be an easy, fast road to despair. That's right. Right? Yeah. And the I devil gets in there. It right and in there. You. Oh, yeah. now you're going to sit and eat your dad's food and you're not going to do it. So, mm. but the power of love, back to cliches, the power of love is that you can receive that mercy without despair. Yeah. Because the person looking at you is seeing you in a way that you want to be seen. Yeah. That you want to be. Yep. I want to be. I've said that story before when I first met Melanie. One of the things that just blew me away was that she would look at me as a man, the man I always wanted to be. And I was, a, trust nice. me, I was a boy. I was, I was buck wild. But she would look at me, <laughs> she would look at me in such a way. And I part mm. of me was just like, that's, I love that. that's who I want to be. You look at me like the man I want to be. That's, that's who good. I want to be, you know? And I think love is that, that's, that's, the, that's inherent to true love. That when you can show that to a brother, you can show that to a friend, yeah. you can show that to a stranger, it's beyond words. It's, it's a really, it's an encounter. How do you um, slightly, Different topic. <laughs> How do you as a father give your daughter away to a dude who you know is broken, like you were broken, maybe more, who's been raised in a culture that's wild? And yeah. How the bloody hell do you do that? Can I tell you that on October 13th? <laughs> <laughs> yes. October 12th. Yeah. Uh, for, fortunately, I like I like him a lot. And, Good. Um, and I, I love his family. I love knowing where he came from, at least. Yeah. There's something in there that set a certain expectation of, yeah. of what it means to be, and I know it's there. But you know, we all make our own choices, decisions, and like you said, we're all, we're all broken. And yeah. he's a very transparent young man in a good way, that he's, there's no, there's no um, you know, airs or any kind of uh, mm. things put on. And, but then again, you know, I just know too much. I know too much, you know, married 26 years, I know too much ministry for 25 years. I yeah. know I know the dangers, the pitfalls. So for me, it's going to be more imbalanced on the other side of yeah. just saying, well, you know what? It's like the police officer whose daughter wants to drive across country. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and he's Very like, good. And he's like, wait a minute. You know, the highest murder rate yes. is actually in this state. So I want you to go yes. around this state. You know, you can't. No, you can't. You know, because I, I think like my wife and I, man, we was like, woo. We were just like, <laughs> living on love. What's your plan? Don't have a plan. I was fired on my birthday a month before my wedding 
in America. So I'm now what? illegal and unemployed. <laughs> Uh, like but a, love will find a way. I had a music ministry position. Wow. The, the priest and I clashed really badly. Part part of it was my fault. Mostly it was his fault. <laughs> this is a, even in retrospect. I think <laughs> it was. Every because I, I since looked back and I realized everyone around me got fired. The last youth minister got Ooh. fired. The one after me got fired. The youth, this guy got fired. And, and everyone had the same sure. weird experience. Okay. So while there were certainly deficiencies, and you know, on, on my part, coming from a small country town in South Australia. Um, it, it was weird. It was just weird. But anyway, I'm on my birthday, oh a month, and I'm going to call my father-in-law up. I'm like, so I'm unemployed and I'm illegal, and I'm pumped to marry Cameron next <laughs> <laughs> next month. Dude, he was great, though. I don't know how he was great. I don't know if I would have been great. But yeah, you can't tell people what they're not ready to hear. And yes, so, like, trying right. to tell them about how marriage is going to be amazing and it's going to be brutal. When you can't hear that, oh yeah, I know. Yeah, you don't know. No, you don't. No, you don't. And that might be a mercy, also. I mean, imagine. It is a mercy. Imagine getting totally. a getting a flash, one of those flash forwards, like the on, on, at the altar before you're getting married, and Here's nobody would be like, married. Nobody no, exactly. Would marry. And we we do tend to. So become, there's, a, there's a balance, and we, the church. I think the church has wisdom here when she talks about you know the requirements. You know what makes marriage marriage, mm -hmm. besides male female, which is the obvious, is um, the consent. That there's a, there's an authentic consent. To what marriage is, yeah. as as opposed to some litany of you know you know voting booth tests of understanding the theology of marriage. Right. And it, it really is: are you in it? Yeah, and are you free to enter oh, into totally. it? Oh, totally. Because we had no plan. Yeah. My wife and I had no plan. <laughs> we were crazy. Like yeah. looking back, I'm like, what were we thinking? Yeah. But we well, hear these great stories too about you know couples who you know met on a Thursday, married on a Friday, and they're celebrating their fiftieth anniversary. I mean, it's it happens. It's possible because it's you know. I just want to pause for a moment from this fantastic discussion I'm currently having with Damon to say a big thanks to Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is the best filtering and accountability software on the web. If you're going to give your child something like this, you better have Covenant Eyes on it because you see the stuff when you go online that you shouldn't be seeing, they're seeing it as well. We wanna protect our kids. So go to covenanteyes.com and get the best filtering and accountability software on the web. Use the promo code MATTFRAD when you sign out, uh, sign up rather, and you'll get a month for free, 30 days for free. You can try it. If you don't like it, cancel it. You won't be charged a cent. We use it, the Frad household. It's on all of our devices. Um, and I really recommend that you check this out. Maybe you don't have kids, but maybe you're tempted to look at porn. Get Covenant eyes. Really, I think it's one of those kind of essential things. The filtering, easy, easily enough explained, it blocks the bad stuff. The accountability side of it's really cool though, because if you go to a website that you shouldn't go to, your accountability partner will get a report and it'll tell them where you went, what you typed in, how long you were on different websites. And the point of this isn't so your accountability partner will shame you, but they will invite you to be a better person. If you've been struggling with porn and you haven't used Covenant Eyes, I want to strongly recommend that you do that right now. CovenantEyes.com. And when you sign up, use the promo code MATTFRAD. You can try it for a month for a free. And I think you'll agree with me that it's really excellent software that you're going to want to get. Let's talk about something a bit more controversial. Um, of course we are. Six. <laughs> Not controversial. Beautiful. Uh, oh, it's not? I thought it was dirty. No. No, it is. It's no, bad no, for you. No, no, no. You one of those Christians? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was uh, saying to you before the show that I feel like, and let me run this by you. I want us to develop this. I think it's a cool kind of thought. People used to look at Christians like uptight, preachy, boring people who are always offended. Moralistic. Moralistic. I reckon that the quote-unquote left... To, for lack of a better term, is like that today. <laughs> like the democratic debates are like that. Like um, CNN or, okay, that might be a little too polarizing, but Hollywood, it's like whenever you watch any of those shows and they get up, it's they're preaching at me. Mm. They, 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 they're telling me I'm not good enough. They're, they're, they're always offended and they're bloody boring. <laughs> like have you watched the, the slow uh, bloody, what do you say, digression? Of, of, of people like Stephen Colbert mm. who've just become insufferable? Or do you mm. even think he's insufferable? I don't know. You know just I, these late I, night I've comedians. Seen, I've seen who, all of this. Yeah, they're a, all preaching now. We're, we're, we're definitely in a new, a new cultural phase, we can say that. And um, on one hand, it's, it's the death of you know, hypocrisy meaning anything, right? Because we're all hypocrites. You, know, you blame somebody for doing something else, you do the exact same thing on, on the other side. 
but I, I, yeah. I, I'm always, I'm always like looking around. I'm, I'm trying to be more self-aware about the the bubble that I live in, you know, yeah. and, and whether the fingers I'm pointing at somebody is me pointing too. back at me because I do it. I know that I do it. I know, yeah. and I come from a good place. Like, well, that's just not, that's not who we are as a person. So I've got to say something. And mm -hmm. so on one hand, you want to affirm, you know, those who have who've, uh, really just pummeled uh, the Christian faith and have built these safe spaces, these non-Christian spaces, whether it's, you know, Hollywood and, and movie production or whether it's music artists and the whole world of music or- Why are we work. affirming them? Because they're expressing what they sincerely believe to be true. That's sincerely wrong. Right. But, but the sincerity of that was part of what they were railing against. Okay that regardless of how sincerely you believe your faith, keep yeah. it to yourself, yeah. right? You're a walking rebuke in a certain sense as a Christian by living a marriage and family, by, yeah. you know, eschewing contraception and by you all these, you know, by having more than three kids or, you know, those things are, but just shut up anyway. Mm -hmm. But now the zeal of having to really reclaim America you know, of having to get back to decency and has now put them in this place of needing to proselytize and needing to exert all the pressure and the power that they have to make sure that their truth becomes the norm. I mean, it's exactly the mirror of what, what Christianity has been accused of and yeah. sometimes guilty of. Part of me wonders <laughs> if it's because of the lack of scientific backing for things like transgenderism. The idea that I can be a woman at four o'clock this afternoon and then maybe a man later on. If you, it's, it almost feels like this kind of religion that has no basis in reality and so you have to be super dogmatic about it because you can't actually explain it with reason. Yeah, I think part of that too is we, we literally come from a place where knowing that faith and reason have never been at odds. Mm -hmm. you know, as John Paul has said in Fetus Eratio, two wings that bring us to yeah. the... To the so, we always look for the reason in the faith and we look for the faith in the reason. Mm. I mean, that, that's part of the, yep. in, when we're coming up as Christians, we don't, right? We, we get taken in by reason mm -hmm. and then we learn the faith and yeah. or we could take it in by a, a faith and then we realize there's whole reason behind it. Yep. But at some point we're moving toward a maturity yeah. of faith and reason. And I think sometimes we project that onto people who have really stupid ideas that somehow they're you know, supposed to have, they're a, supposed reason to have a reason behind the yeah. faith or that they're supposed to have a faith behind their reason. And it's not true outside of that, that Christological, that, that truth about the faith. But so they, people say yeah. stuff in about you know what it means to be a person, to be male or female, or gender is in is a social construct, or that it's it's part of the brain, a male yeah. brain, a female brain, or I was born in the wrong body. We hear stuff, we go like, oh, that's just... That. So the challenge now is realizing there is no continuity between faith and reason, even in this sincerely held false faith and false reason and we can't expect it otherwise we're just going to we're just going to frustrate ourselves uh, okay so maybe the more mature response you know there's the childlike you're all wrong and then yep. the adult like you know let's let's reason together mm -hmm. maybe the adult response is more of i hear what you're saying example i've always felt that i was wrong you know born in the wrong body <clears throat> and being able to hear that without taking it literally and I'm working on this, so you, you, you can bounce this off of me as well, right? If we can set aside the demand that faith and reason are coordinated outside of the revealed gospel, if we can set that aside, that yeah. they're not related, then when someone says something that is anthropologically or philosophically or medically or biologically impossible, yeah. and they say something ridiculous. Yeah, you can, maybe, still, you can still empathize. Like, that sounds really yeah, hard. Yeah, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me, but wow, you're really feeling something here that you, there's probably not even a vocabulary Do you think that exists for you to express what you're really experiencing. Yeah, yeah, but that's true because I remember somebody talking about um, what it's like to feel like being born in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. They said it'd be like boarding a plane in LA and you start flying and you're expecting to get to Atlanta in four or five hours. And then someone comes on, they're like, actually, no, this is, this is just it now. Like, you're not ever getting off. This is, wow. this is it. Wow. I mean, it sounds terrible. It sounds tragic and awful, and that must that must be terrible. So, is your point that we should be empathizing where people are coming from? It is, and sort of acknowledging that where we use reason to expand and understand the meaning of our faith, or that we use faith to make the importance of our reason, right? So they work together. Mm -hmm. Without that, you, you're left with fragments of vocabulary of words. Mm -hmm. um, the ability or the desire, the need to express what you're experiencing because it's so painful. 
and to put that additional demand on that you speak rationally mm-hmm. or I won't listen to you is more of a childlike okay. response than it is an adult response. I think I think the problem people have though is it's one thing <laughs> if you're being irrational but I'm trying to be kind to you. It's another when you have a bunch of irrational people who lead a certain school and now they're teaching. Exactly. And that was the back to my insanity. little Twitter spat this morning. That's that's the point that I was that's making this morning. That's when it becomes difficult to be like, I get you. You, you would like, never no, no, sit no. across. You would never sit across with somebody and call them an ideology. That just that you're an idiot. If you're doing that, you're just adult, right? Okay. So don't say the idea of the, the presence of gender ideology and using that word is offensive, so we shouldn't use that word anymore. Yeah. That's that's forgetting that this is a clash of ideas yeah. and of ideals. Yeah. So when it's proper to speak about schools teaching particular things, I mean, you say, no, 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 that ideology is false. It's wrong. Okay. It's a false anthropology. But if you're if you're having a beer with somebody and they're telling you to pour no, their heart totally. out. Totally. Maybe the problem is we don't sit with people who pour their heart out anymore. Yeah, and we don't. Generally sit, speaking, and we, we just, don't and we don't we don't debate ideas either. So if you're going to look at both of those spheres, yeah. we don't do either one. Well, we do we do debate ideas, or at least we yell about them on Twitter. And that and that's exactly what that's the poison, in my opinion. That that's not that's not debate. That's not dialogue. That's not dialogue. Is this dynamism of working toward what is true? That Benedict yeah. talked about. That Pope Benedict talked about. Dialogue is not a good in and of itself. Yeah. It's a tool so that we can reason together to, the to get to the yeah. truth. Yeah. But we disagree on what the truth is. So dialogue ends up being just this the stone throwing match of I'm yeah. right, you're wrong, and I'm gonna destroy you, yeah, totally. and you're gonna acknowledge it, and I'm gonna keep going until you say, Uncle, you've got me. Yeah. And we go, yeah. Uncle, what's that from? Oh, that's an old like no. American thing. Like, you know, you, you put the arm behind and say, say uncle, oh, say uncle. Okay. You're yeah, like, yeah, who's yeah, your yeah. daddy? Yeah. Who's your uncle, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're like, we, we want submission. Okay, and that, that and is this, what this, we want. It is, and we want it, and we, we look for those headlines. The clickbaits are always, yeah. you know, well, Ben Shapiro destroys, right, right? And I'm sure he rolls his eyes at it too, but yeah. The clicks, but, yeah. the clicks are people, because people want to say, okay, finally we can put this debate to end because yeah. now I've beaten you with yeah. the area of ideas. Well, yeah. you can retreat there to such a distorted extent that you can't even stand before somebody and be at peace right. to right. actually hear their story and go, dang, man, I don't, I don't know what that's like, but I, I, I would be crushed mm-hmm. and not feel the need. Well, let me just tell you what the Catechism 2245 says about that. Right, and yet, <laughs> and yet there are, so then what, what do you do? Because it's not just a matter of sitting over a beer and being sympathetic with somebody. When this, this is a cultural, I don't know if this is a culture. If culture means life lived in common, we don't, I think, have a culture in the United States of America, apart from a Super Bowl and a hangover or something. But <laughs> if this, um, you know, if there is a societal conversation going on about these er- issues, People want to have their say, whether they should or not. And so we are, th- what else do you do? I mean, you well, write a blog, you do a video, we do this, we... We do, but the reason we can do this and people try it in other ways is because we love each other. Mm-hmm. We will the good for each other, right? We respect, there's a reverence here that says, I don't know where this is going to go, but if you say something, yeah, it's well, not a personal true. attack yeah. on me. And it's not me looking for the hole to show yeah, yeah, an yeah. idiot that you are, yeah. right? So I think there's a there's an a priori yeah. reverence yep. that... Is, is missing broader culture. But also the, the conversations aren't meant to serve truth, right? I'll talk about culture. Mm-hmm. It's not just a, a place of common living. I like Benedict, Pope Benedict's ex- expression of culture as uh, the, the ecosystem, the environment where you flourish. Hmm. So the culture in a, in a Petri dish for a virus is mm-hmm. specifically in humidity and temperature so that that culture can flourish. Mm. That, I mean, so that virus can flourish. So as a human person, as an organism, what is the environment, the ecosystem where we flourish and become all that we are? And that's where we speak about the virtues. We speak about community and communion yep. and love and joy and all these things that are part of it. So we can have dialogue, and it's not really dialogue. It's more of saying, which side do you want? Yeah, right, that's who, right. Who are you with? Yeah. Who, who are your people? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I saw you with such and such, so you're one of them. Okay, mm-hmm. well, let me, this is how I talk mm-hmm. to one of them, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a balkanization. It's a, it's a, it's a very... This uh, is, is this identity politics? I think that's the heart. That's where it's expressed in an over and an outsized influence in politics, right? So politics is so outsized in its influence yeah. in our culture now, and has been that yeah. way for about forty years, in my opinion. Mm. Um, oversized, you know, whether it's a Supreme Court, whether it's a Congress, whether it's a politics in general is now seen as the arbiter of justice and of flourishing and of happiness for the human person. Mm-hmm. That's not an overstatement, right? If the government would just do this, give this, work yeah. this, get out of this, stop taxing this, tax this more, mm-hmm. you know, you know, illegal, make this. And I'm not making a libertarian argument here. I'm just saying libertarianism is on the grow precisely because 
of the outsized influence of, of the body politic. So in that combination of politics being oversized and the inability to even agree on what's true, much less reverence one another in a search for truth, we're fooling ourselves thinking that Twitter is gonna be a place of the exchange of ideas. Yeah. It's weaponized. Yeah. And my job is to take you down with my weapon. So why are you on it if it's, if it's for Peer the pressure. most part bad? Peer pressure. Yeah. And I'm really not. I mean, I, I, I get on, um, usually when I get on Twitter, it's because I'm procrastinating. Yeah, totally, you know, yeah. or I'm supposed to be doing something and then something refresh, comes up and, refresh, and they bring refresh. me back. They keep sending me these, here's what you've missed on your here's notifications. You were last time. <laughs> if you're not outraged, yeah. you haven't clicked on your, you know. Yeah. But I get on it and it's just exhausting. It's exhausting. You should do what I did. You should pay someone to run it for I you. am. I said, not exactly what I'm going to do. I just, you know, I'm one of those poor uh yeah. micromanagers of like, well, you do this a little better than well, me. Do, do this like Well, I'm my guy, <laughs> Ken and Doyle, who does it all for me, like, I'm like, okay, you can quote from this person, this person, and this person. Like, you can quote from the Bible. You can quote Pope Benedict. Advertise my videos when they come out. But then I just... Oh, that's... that's I love that. Step back, yeah. I love that. Because, I mean, there's there's a there's a need to be in the marketplace, right? Um, but, but this the isn't the marketplace. I, but I, I mean, have... in, terms of, in terms of ministry, but I'm not conditioned to be able to do it well. Right. So I'm not the one to do it. But I my message right. in my ministry is, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for what you're saying. No, and I'm trying to find a way to disagree with you because I'm always <laughs> a little bummed when people talk about Twitter as a marketplace and St. Paul would be on Twitter. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, maybe he would. No, have. Titus would. I'm not sorry, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Paul would be like, I can't right. take this anymore. <laughs> Titus, you do it. <laughs> I wish they would cut themselves. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just, I don't know. I just want to push back against that idea, even though I think it's ultimately right that Catholics ought to be on social media and ought to be tweeting and using it effectively. I think that is true. But just when I hear the cliches like St. Paul would be on Twitter, I'm like, I don't know. Like, can we just, can we really seriously question this for a bit? What do you have nothing better to well, do? Well, you know, it's one of those, those good hypotheticals, and I'm not advocating for it, but I mean, you, you hear about him talking about, you know, at the Areopagus and his right. ability to engage yeah. even the most advert pagans of the time. And, the, yeah. well, you know, he would go for where the heat is. I, I think he would, but, yep. but that doesn't mean I'm St. Paul. Well, that's right. Yeah. So there's a, there's another level there that just that's says, true. You gotta consider, you know, yeah. let's that's find correct. our St. Pauls and let's get them on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think people like Bishop Robert Barron and others are using social media I am media a huge fan well. of his. And I, and I, too. and I, I think, you know, his, his ability and nobody's perfect. So it's not like he, but when he enters into an art and a discussion, when he expands on something, I, I, I learn something all the time. Yeah. And to me, that's the edifying. I get built up from it. Is he the complete answer? Is he the way that's I would right. say it? Absolutely not. But at the same time, this man is is a gift. Did you see him on uh, Dave Rubin's show a couple of times? I did. I did. I, 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 yeah. It took me a while to kind of get used to putting those worlds together. But I was yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> well, when he answered like on homosexual marriage and things, I wasn't satisfied. I, I was didn't not think he did all. a good job. But he wasn't talking to me. Uh, That's how I well, rationalized it in true, my head. You know? He wasn't talking to me. Because I was like, what about this? Do this. Tell this. Because I do this all day long. This yeah. is what I do. And I know he's on. we're on the same page here. Yeah. But he didn't go there. And I'm not saying he's a master strategist, but I'm not going to fault him anymore than yeah. other people faulting me about what I did or didn't cover yeah. You know, at a youth event versus a marriage event versus a clergy event. So My point just though is like, okay, how would I do in that situation? So like, yeah, I get that you're criticizing him for this one thing he didn't say. And maybe you're right to criticize him because none of us are beyond criticism. But suppose I was in that chair. Like, do you really think you would have nailed it, Matt Fred? <laughs> I don't think so. You know what, what, what my, my, my come to Jesus moment was? And uh, he's a friend now, Ryan Anderson. Ryan yeah, Anderson, he's Ryan. wonderful. Oh my gosh, he was fantastic. When he was first coming up, and we've been on a treat together and, you know, mm. we've talked here or there. Not good friends, I wish we were. But um, he did... The, uh, whose show was it? Oh, I know who you mean. That bloody English bloke. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That oh, was the first. English bloke. Ben Shapiro talked about gun control on it. Who was he? Uh, Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan. Yeah. Right. Oh, and, that was amazing. Uh, amazing. Amazing. And when I and I knew of him, How but I didn't he know. he kept him. cool under pressure during that? Beyond pressure. Did you see the setup? They, they literally all sat. Looking no, at him. they sat him with the audience. Yes, they put Susie Orman on the stage, yep. pivoted across from Pierce Morgan as they're having. I just think it's on American. <laughs> well, that's terrific, you idiot. But give me an argument. But I, I do the same thing you just said. I put myself in that after oh, I don't know right. fifteen years on the road with unbelievable <laughs> You're circumstances. An idiot. No, you I would have. I would have been just. I, yeah. I, I don't know. But you look at that and you're like, you're where you're supposed to be. Yeah. That's the gifting. Oh, yes. So you say, you know what? So I gifted. may not be Paul here, but we need some Ryan Anderson's oh, here baby, over here. Yeah. We he need some amazing. people. And 
when we can recognize that, isn't that the body of Christ? Well, what did he say? What was one of the things he said? Because it was, for those who weren't aware of it, they were talking about legalizing same-sex marriage, so-called, and he was arguing for why not? And they were kind of just uh, throwing a bunch of ad hominems at him. And then he, I love that he played Obama against them. Well, I, I agree with Obama that there can be like intelligent people on both sides of this discussion. Because that's who your argument is with. And that, what was beautiful was because he could have gone for the home run reason because he's done all this in terms of his yep. book and what is marriage with what you know Sharif work? Gerges and, and, and yeah. Bobby George. He could have gone high in terms of the meat, but he that was not was not the question they were asking. So what I thought was genius from a strategic view was they had gone so low in terms of you must be a terrible person. You hate me. Why yeah. do you hate my wife? Yeah. Why do you I mean Susie, she was true. like, why do you hate me? I mean that was yeah. one of the questions I think was like, why do you hate me? And they had gone so low, all they had to do was was an appeal to civil discussion. Yeah. That's right. If they had gone He's higher, like, why do you have to attack my character? Exactly. You seem like a lovely person. I wouldn't attack you. That's Pauline. That's Ooh, a Pauline baby. approach, right? You see all these beautiful statues here, and they see one hair that says to the unknown yeah. God. Let me tell you about this unknown God. Yeah. You think he would have done that in Jerusalem? He would have been stoned if he appealed yeah, to that's a pagan interesting. God. I thought of that. Right. So there's something about the not just knowing your audience, but something about yeah, knowing being the environment present, and being present. Okay. And yet being confident in the objective truths, but knowing what it takes to get somebody from this point to this point. Yeah. Not to hear, but to, to get right. them a little point to hear. And just the appeal to civil discussion <sighs> set everybody on their heels like, oh, wait a minute. So you're saying we just disagree. Yeah. And if you follow that, I'm going to take you all the way in, yep. all the way up to the meaning of marriage. That's what I was going to say a moment ago, like this all or nothing thing. If Bishop Barron isn't the answer to everything, he's the answer to nothing. That's all or nothing. But then it's also, you need to fully convert somebody all or you've done nothing. It's well, never why, happened in why the history do I do of that? anything. No. How why about I do I... my piece yeah. and then leave that to the to the mercy and the matrix of God so his neighbor can say something yeah. else, his pastor well, can say something. even to an evangelical friend, why can't I tell him like, look, you can, you can, you can agree with me that Mary's the mother of God. It doesn't mean you have to think she was immaculately conceived. Okay, and you argue for it. Okay, yeah, I guess mm. I guess she's a mother of God. Great. And then you can further that discussion. But the idea that I have to have you buy everything, everything or yes. you can have nothing. It's true. It's how we don't, none of us work like that. Like when I became a Christian when I was 17, if you had have told me in order to become a Christian, I had to agree to save sexual marriage, I would have been like, I don't, I'm not, I can't do that though, you know? And I think you hear, you read and hear the major concert conversion stories. And if you really <clears throat> unpack them, you realize just how many people played a role in a re, in the full conversion. Yeah. The glory ones are the last ones, right? The last yeah, people right. just yeah, before yeah, yeah, your yeah. baptism. And you're like, I want to thank that stuff for being that's with right. us. But the hundreds of just God moments mm -hmm. that allowed you to be open just a little bit more to yeah. hear what somebody had said to you that a, a day later, earlier, you would never heard them. They would yeah. say the exact same thing. Yeah. You would have been like, Mind your business. That reminds me of Paul. I think it's Galatians or something, right? Like, uh, does Barnabas is it? Does the planting? Or I do the planting. He does the watering, but God gives the growth. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. So there's a and, and we don't need to be privy to the to the full, but we do need to have a reverence that staying in our lane. Using our yeah. phrases again, staying in our lane means yeah. I'm not the be all end all. Yeah, I'm not your full version. I don't need to be. I don't, need to be. Yeah. I don't have all the answers for you. But when push comes to shove, you're going to be like, you know what? This all started around Matt's barbecue. Yeah. So at least I can just, I don't know, I'm stuck on here and here, but I'm 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 just gonna go hang out. Yeah. Because he he I know how much he cares. Yeah. Well there's a temptation too with this YouTube channel, and I'm sure with your ministry, Joy to Be, mm -hmm. which I want to talk about, it's like this idea that it has to be huge. Why? Like if I have a yeah. thousand views on a YouTube video, why can't that be enough? Yeah. Like again, like how many people did St. Paul personally reach out to? Uh, how many people well, I mean, I know they read his letters, so that's perhaps that's different. Um but yeah, Christ didn't write anything down. Or yeah, no, so, no. There's there's so much to that. We, again, back to this Notre Dame symposium last. And somebody from Steubenville, I, I should remember his name. He's wonderful. Um, was presenting on um, their multimedia outreaches, and they're working with other adult, online adult learning. And mm -hmm. it's a wonderful man. But he made an appeal, a strong one, which I took as a serious rebuke. And he was based, oh, in a good way. Yeah, like it was a correction. Um, that where it was. You know, so many ministries are just trying to be big, big, big and, and go national. And yes. you get an idea, you get a program, and then you want to go national. He was like, I get it. He said, I, I get it. He says, but the power is, uh, the power is local. It is. He said, the power is, when you when you make this work, don't so be so worried about scalability. Yeah. He said, everyone wants to scale it so that we can go national. He says, make this work and God will do the growing. 
And I, I sort of took it like, you know, dude, you know, this, this is America. You know, we, we, <laughs> we made this, something big. <laughs> yeah, <right? Yeah. laughs> so you don't know about it, then it doesn't exist yet, right? Yeah, a, but then I checked myself and I was like, wow, I really do think like that. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe the answer really is to get those 12 couples really, you yeah. know, in my parish, really major converted and let, 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 let God do the growing as opposed to immediately you, thinking, how do I make this? national and yeah. immediately. Did you see any Hickman's interview that I did? I know you say you I didn't. Speak. I haven't seen any. Yeah, I saw the picture. Oh, you'll love it. I love any. One of the, I love any uh, to death. One yeah. of the reasons uh, I, I bring him up is he runs those uh, weekly porch nights, open porch nights. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and our That's family has started doing that monthly. So this Sunday, we have open porch night and we have a bunch of people coming over to the house. Love it. That's uh, it. People we don't know. People can invite anyone. They just have to bring something to share. Yeah. And we say grace, and that's the only prayer we do. And then we just sit and smoke cigars and talk. And oh, I life. love that. And there's like 20 kids on the trampoline. And, you know, it's people are like, how do you have this many people in your house? I'm like, I have a cleaner tomorrow. That's how. <laughs> uh, or force us to clean yesterday. <laughs> so you see that too. <laughs> but no, but this, to your point, like that's why I love Any. I love him so much because he's more interested in having one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. Because he's been in this for a long time, long Andy, time. actually. Yep. Like he's been... And he shines in front of 5,000 kids Ooh, at a, at he's a Stephenville. He's incredible. I mean, I, I've heard very few people as... He can weave together a Stephenville weekend like he's he excellent, can, right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, and yet, he's committed to these, you know, inviting over neighbors who are different faiths, you know, like different sexual that. orientations. Why not? If that's the way you say it. So Why people not? don't get angry at me, but like... And just loving people. It's amazing. We should do that. It's amazing I, that it amazes us. That he's like, you should come around and have a beer? No, 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 no exactly. <laughs> yeah. You just want me to come you over? Just, yeah. Well, he said when he first started doing this, that he's people thought he was selling M way. M way. That's what he thought. It's great. Like, what you, oh, you really meant just to come over? Like, yeah, what did you think? We thought I you come, were selling I come doterra Two months ago, that's right. I thought you were going to sell me something. Yeah. Exactly. Because that's the American way. Yeah. Yeah, we're using each other. Sadly. Yeah. Right. There's always an agenda. There's always something that's that's mutually beneficial, but really about me. Yeah. So just to hang, <laughs> just to yeah. yeah, it's uncomfortable to host it, and it's comfortable to take somebody's invitation. Yeah. Unless you have a pool. Yeah. Unless you have some particular beer, or particular whiskey, mm -hmm. or some cigars that I have. You know, it's some pretense that at least says, well, you know, if it all goes to pot, at least I had a good drink. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, well, that is actually okay. I'm okay with people thinking that because we do have whiskey and beer, and you know. But yeah, gosh, getting back to the human things like conversation and bourbon on a porch and just being together. And, and, and the other end too, because it's so powerful, it's also powerful when you're among strong believers, right? You know, that, that sense when you're with, you know, whether it's friends or couples and, and you start talking about something and we're all processing, like we are right now, we're processing in a way that all the presumption about uh, the truth about God the love of our faith and our lady and mm -hmm. and we're still trying to figure out the mess of our own life the mess of our family and the world so there's a there's an there's also that that community and gathering that's powerful mm -hmm. when we share so much in common that we can go even further in our in our uh, our, our faith and in, in our life and why shouldn't it work with folks who we don't share it's yeah. a different encounter it's a yeah. different party have you noticed yeah. that what do you mean? it's a different party when you invite people that are not in your bubble definitely right and in a sense that you're you can't, you don't talk the same way and yeah. you can't presume anything yeah. and, and it's, it's okay. It's, it's like, we're so comfortable. We need some, some affliction. We need, yeah. you know, we're so afflicted. We need some comfort. So, well, this is what I found so funny about like this, this environment in which we live, like where I'm continually being told by the media that I hate black people and mm -hmm. gay people. And but I'm like, it's just, it's so not true. Like I, I was at the hospital recently and uh, there was a man there who was my nurse, clearly <laughs> living a homosexual lifestyle mm. from how he acted and what he said. I would love him to come over mm. in, a, in a party and get to know him. Sure. And, and honestly, my first thought isn't to convert him. Maybe I should feel bad about that, but I just, I would love to have a beer with him and get to know him. See, now, I, I, I'm it, always, honestly, I try to look the best in, mm. in, in people. So when I hear the argument from, you know, from fellow Catholics and Christians about how we need to let go of all the doctrine and just love people as they right. are. I, I take that portion of it and say, amen. I take that portion and I say, absolutely, amen. You know, I, uh, I'm, Because loving people as they are will mean leading them to truth, but it, not in, in a my weird, world, systematized in, way. In my world. But I, I also am well aware that many advocate that because they don't like the church's uh, teachings. Yes, yeah, of course. So we have to be course. eyes wide open and say, you know what, there's truth yeah. here, 
but I'm not blind to the fact that you're saying that because, because you think you that the, think the teaching this, yeah. is oppressing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The teaching but you, out. from you as an Orthodox Catholic, can agree wholeheartedly with what they're saying. Joyfully. Oh, well, maybe not. Not if they mean drop the doctrine, being ignore it. But if they mean we don't need to talk about a doctrine, we just need to love people, sure. And I, part of me is like, well, what idiot would invite somebody over to a beer and then start preaching to them about the catechism? Right. Sit like, down. It's like, <laughs> Lock I the mean, doors. I mean, seriously. That's yeah. really, that's really. And it's almost like it's kind of a manipulative and weird to kind of like, I'm going to become his friend so that I can. Yeah. Yeah. There's that strain that's cuts across everything. It feels a bit weird. It cuts across. I mean, the guy was trying to sell me a roof, you know, six months ago and the same thing. He's like, hey, great house. Hey, where are you from? Hey, what's your kids? Let me tell you about. And I'm like, I know why you're here. Let's just get to the yeah. roof yeah. thing, bro. You know, let's, you know. Yeah. So there's, oh, there's, there's some of that. But there's also, there are authentic disagreements and different ideologies, mm -hmm. uh, different ecclesiologies, yeah. what is the church, different views on who Christ is. Some of them, most of them have been dealt with in terms of yep. heresies in the past. Yep. But these things are still swirling around. So mm. just because somebody says, you're talking too much about abortion, you know, you got to stop this language of gender ideology. You yeah. got to go out and actually sit down and have you ever met a gay person, an LGBTQ, like, yeah. like that's going to change the doctrine. What's funny is when I got banned from Google, did you hear about all that? I did. Um, someone was in that thread. They were like, oh, let me guess. You're going to bring out the tired canard of, I did read that. You know, I, I read know that. gay people. But I'm like, well, I do. And <laughs> Thanks I, for lampshading uh, that. But actually, it's true. I do <laughs> love people. You know, and so it's like, but what's my options? Either I say, no, I wasn't going to bring out that tired canard. <laughs> I don't hang out with people with that attraction. Like, ah! You hate it. Or I do. I told you. So, no, 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 no. And you that's what I mean by that's it's it's um it's it's battle. It's not dialogue. So I we weaponize the, something. I think the defensiveness we see in the LGBT community, a lot of it comes from a I'm just gonna say it, and I'm gonna get banned from YouTube because of it. I think it's a recognition that they are engaged in shameful behavior and they need you to praise it. Yeah. Like I'm engaged in sexual choices with my wife and people criticize my sexual choices. You know, they'll say, how many kids are you going to have, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't get super defensive about that because I, I don't feel embarrassed about it or like I need you to agree with me. I think maybe it's like I am engaged in something wrong and I need not only for you to tolerate me, I need you to celebrate me. Yeah, so since we're, we're transparent and open here, I let me say long form what I agree and what I disagree. Okay. I agree that um, it's a human reality, right? That when guilt turns to shame, guilt meaning knowing I did something wrong, mm -hmm. shame being, oh, now I am what I did wrong. Yeah. Right. It, it moves to the identity. Yeah. So shame is what is what we, we, we fight against. And there's actually a nice little debate online about this, which I thought was fascinating, trying huh? to posit the positive value of shame, right? Interesting. But I, I, I still think shame is a negative in the sense that it, it, it imposes yeah. a false identity. That's all, that's all how you define it. Like, as you say, yeah. shame is... Um, <clears throat> what do you say? Feeling bad for who I am, or no? Guilt is knowing you've done something wrong. Yeah, it's it's based in the action. And Very healthy. So shame is that I going am off. something wrong. I am. Yeah. Now, right. So I, I, anybody, I lied. As I am a liar. So as you've defined that, yeah, I don't know how you could agree that that's healthy. But. So, so, I, so I think in a human way, not just LGBTQ or whatever, in a human way, when we've allowed some guilt, some bad action, guilt becomes shame. We we have two reasons. We either go out. You know, and try to justify or, and, mm -hmm. or anger. Planned Parenthood, yes. healthcare, women's everything, rights, everything. It's going to be rape. You have me to too. celebrate it, right? I mean, there's a there's a. Hang on, wait, what? Well, I'm just in terms of if you've been raped and in okay, injustice, sure. right? Guilt, whatever shame, oh, and all gets mixed in there. It, it gets down to an identity wrongly because shame is always trying to distort our identity right. and there's either a, a deep internalizing, you know, of anger and depression, or there can be this lashing out of the anger. So my point is that I think it's a human condition that when we experience something that gets to the level of shame, mm -hmm. that there are there are only a handful of reactions to that. Yeah. And I, I do believe that any one of those sexual guilt and shame encounters because of its inherent power has the same effect and a powerful one. And I do read a lot of that. And here, here's where, that's where I agree with. What I want to be very careful in this. Yeah. Um, and, and this is, I make a, a very clear distinction. I just finished a course for with um uh, Cincinnati, Archdiocese of Cincinnati, mm -hmm. on the transgender mm. uh, issue, specifically for catechists in the schools. Was it helpful? It, it was. So, I, I, it'll be released in the fall. I, I, I love it. It's, it's the most time I've had in four, four lessons to unpack and help wow. Catholic catechists deal with this in the classroom, yeah, yeah. or in RCA, etc. But my point was that um, I'm, I make a very clear distinction between teaching and understanding and dealing at the in the in the in the realm of ideas and ideals yes, right okay. that ideology 
and how we encounter people. Mm -hmm. And I see the extremes of these in these difficult, sensitive issues where someone will cling to one or the other yes. to such a distorted imbalance like it. Yep. that it almost gives the impression that you can do one and accomplish the good of right. saving someone's soul. So, so saying about the, like I could speak theoretically about how the shame of a certain immoral sexual act and then me needing you to praise me about it, but if you have same-sex attraction or an engaged in a homosexual relationship, you I wouldn't say that to I me. I would never say that. Exactly, to you, and I, I would, would never I would say that to someone either. And exactly, and to some people's point, with anybody, it doesn't have to be homosexuality. It's whatever you're exactly. ashamed about. I wouldn't. It's human. Yeah. So on one hand, we have you know advocates who despise the church's teachings about sex and sexuality in a broad sense, and they accuse us every time we a, a, appeal to that in the realm of ideas that we're attacking people. And it's a, it's a canard. That's right. However, there are people who hear the teaching and are rebuked and it feeds their shame. Yeah. So when we're dealing with people on a personal level, mm -hmm. we have to be very attentive, not to the doctrine, but to the person. Yeah. Right? Because it's not our job to in, impose doctrine. Right. And, and, you, and you never feel no that way. no interest in doing no it. No interest whatsoever, <laughs> yeah, right? right? In a human way. Yeah. But when we get accused of that, yeah. it's always let the doctrine go and just be present. Mm. And there's just enough truth in that that it's not part of the dialogue, the dialogos, right? The word between. Yep. But at the same time, it's, it's precisely what fuels my love for you, is that I know that that's true, not just for me, but it's true from the creator who created us. And it's, it's the cosmos. It is a natural law. Yep. Meaning, law meaning is immutable, mm -hmm. and natural means what makes the is, is. Mm -hmm. So what makes you a human person and is immutable is the truth about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. So I don't need to tell you that, and with no sense this is going to convert you. Mm. But when I'm dialoguing with you, I'm looking at you because I know nothing you've done has unsunned you, if you're a baptized Christian, mm -hmm. has unsunned you as a son of I God like the it. Father. Yep. Right? But you are a prodigal. You are still in the, in the, in the pigsty, yep. and I'm talking to you in a way that's not going to kick your butt to go back home to your dad, right. but to, to, to relight the fire yeah. so that you want to be a son again. Yeah. And you realize that. So that takes the doctrine. Again. It's anthropology again, yeah. before it's morality. And, and that sense of being judged by God in the end, that sense of being uh, you know, in union with the church, to being worthy to receive communion, all these things have an objective and they have a relational reality. Mm. And in one sense, you look at the doctrine that talks about the worthy reception of the Eucharist as an example. Big thing come up in the last few years with the Morris Laetitia, right? Uh, and that on one sense, the doctrine is crystal clear of what is worthy and what is not worthy. Mm -hmm. And, not but, and on the other sense, when was there ever an opportunity, and I've gotten in trouble with this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, right? <laughs> Here we go. When was there ever a scriptural reference or an, an occasion where approaching Christ meant death? Uh, there and, was not a time. Right. So, so when, when, when was, when was it you, were, you were such in such sin and separation from God that you could not approach God in any full form, Jesus Christ in any full form, that the apostles had to keep you from until you reached a certain level? You well, know, no, but I'm thinking God. of St. Paul who's saying that people are even dying because they're approaching the Eucharist unworthily. So my, my point is that, that, that unworthiness is the, is the occasion of judgment, right? You come just like the prodigal son on that breakfast yeah. morning, realizing how unworthy you are, right? And in that moment, there is an objective separation between you and God, and the judgment of that yep. is heaped upon you in that unworthy reception. That, that is, that's, I'm looking at it now in terms of relational lens, not just the objective truth. Okay. That the objective we, doctrine... We, we, we misunderstood each other. What happened there? What? What just happened? I, I, I pointed out the, like, St. Paul saying, if you receive communion, I'm willing. he's talking about that's why some of you have even died. Yes. So when you ask me the question, like, where in the scriptures has someone come to Christ? And yeah, yeah it's I'm, I'm looking at the, at the So it we're talking rhetorical. differently. No, 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 it's rhetorical. I just want to we're clear that up in case we move past it, and then that was really weird. Yeah, no, 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 we're in agreement. I guess I'm, 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 I'm sneaking up on mm -hmm. the idea that somehow uh, Christ and the Eucharist are defamed when the unworthy receive yes. him. Which is true. Which is, well, they it's reach a, a point sacrilege. Of, it is when a, it, it is, yeah. Yes, and the church, ministers of the church, we all have a responsibility to, to, to protect that without a doubt. But subjectively and objectively, where do we find an encounter with Christ in the deepest sin to be 
Well, in, in the, 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 the end of our, but the reception of communion is the sacrilege. It's not like I'm coming and receiving the mercy of God. I'm profaning the sacrament by receiving it. And I agree 100 percent, 100 percent. But that judgment is upon you. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to taking sort of this this bulwark of what we must do in order to approach Christ. And I, I hear the argument being this what I think is untenable uh, in terms of scripture that somehow someone can approach Christ mm -hmm. in a way that defames Christ. Well, okay. Did, did you see what I'm getting at? So well, maybe it's it's both. It's both. And I, the doctrine solid. I have I have zero. Mm -hmm. You know, to be clear, with, to be crystal clear. <laughs> but in the relational sense, I look at that encounter with Christ even as the sacrilege, which happens every day, mm -hmm. sadly, as an occasion like the prodigal son to the prodigal father of mm -hmm. finally realizing the depth of the mercy and love of God, mm -hmm. that even in that, God can use to heal and to convert, Okay, right? Not a means, not even a path that you would suggest anyone do. By any means, you make it very clear. Yeah. You are heaping judgment and death upon yourself when you receive this unworthily. Mm -hmm. You do both and. But at the same time, I think it changes the way that we approach, the way that we speak about that, that while you are approaching in a way that will bring you death, it is the God of life who you will be encountering. It's like we talk about, you know, a purgatory and 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 the the the, uh, the final encounter, of reaching God face to face and mm -hmm. finally realizing just how unworthy that we are. That moment of judgment and justice, okay. and that sacramental approach. There, we basically, I'm, I guess, what I'm arguing basically is we need to trust that that encounter with Christ mm -hmm. has the power to convert, even as it has the power to condemn. And I think that would change the way that we warn people about the way you desecrate or the way that you uh, can wordly or unworldly receive the mm. Eucharist. It's a moment of evangelization, not just a moment of protection. Yeah, I don't know if I mean, it's not that I disagree with you. I'm just still trying to wrap my head around it. I, it I think it's, a, it's pastoral. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing pastorally that while we support fully what the church teaches about the meaning of the Eucharist, it's, it's full presence. Yeah. And even right now, especially when we've got this, you know, the Pew reports about more than half of Catholics right. don't even believe in the full presence. We've got a full-blown crisis here yeah. in terms of the truth full, of who Christ full, is. Full, full-blown. Full-blown. Full blown. So this isn't, this isn't ceding one inch to that. I'm saying as we are sitting on the porch and we're sitting in the barbecue and we're talking about, you know, not only the objective truth of what the Eucharist is, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, mm -hmm. But we speak about having an encounter with Christ that it's not the, uh, again, this personal encounter. It's not the railing of what you have just done to profane the God. Because that railing to the profanity means nothing. Oh, sure. Just like it meant nothing to the to prodigal son on his walk back home. Right. It probably meant nothing during the party, killing the fatty calf. It was really only the next morning, the realization of how unworthy he was, that the real conversion happened. That the real repentance happened. So it takes first the mercy in order then to be aware of just how grave my sin is. Mm -hmm. And if we try to move that one to the other and require the prodigal son, the younger brother, to be repentant and to and to be worthy in order to receive the father and then have the party, we're we're out of order. So then what do you do if you are saying you shouldn't receive? I think it's a matter of melody instead of there's some people who because there would be some people who would say well, because of that, because no one is unworthy to receive Christ in the Eucharist, then you receive Christ in the Eucharist and he'll work in you even though you're committing and that's, a mortal and, sin. And I don't go that far. I know you don't. I, don't. So, I really don't. So then so, what do you say then? I, mean, I think I think it's how we explain. Like I've seen the brilliant, brilliant priests at this, those difficult events, you know, the funerals and yeah. the, the weddings yeah. where, you know, the fallen away siblings come in or the in-laws yeah. or the non-believers. And, and I've heard... Uh, still being very clear about this is the body, blood, soul, mm -hmm. and divinity. For those of you who have this and you're in a state of grace, you know, to yep. be very, and it's a teaching moment within that. Sure. To me, it's not so much the doctrine. It's not the words that were spoken. Yep. I think it's the melody behind the oh, words. Oh, I see. Yeah. And you, you, you don't falsify the melody by trying to be nice yeah. and try to be like, well, we really like you, but you can't receive. I mean, that's just, that's, that's saccharine. Yeah. But when you know uh, the reality of who God is and you really know that God is the one who converts hearts. Mm -hmm. You're doing all within your power, whether as a, 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 you know, a minister, a, a, a ordained minister, or, or someone deputized by, uh, not to protect as if it's just you, but you're protecting their soul. Mm -hmm. And I think when you protect someone's soul, 
there's a different melody in the way that we speak about okay. the church and we speak about the, the faith and we speak about sin mm-hmm. and we speak about conversion. There's a different melody to it. Okay. And people pick up on that, and especially in our, in our culture. So it's not something that could be trained. Say this, 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 and this, and make sure you make an inflection when you say this. And that's, that's all saccharine. Yeah. But I guess I'm appealing to something that's deeply relational as opposed to, to deeply doctrinal. Mm-hmm. We can hold fast to this, but how we actually draw someone to Christ has got to be out of a place of, of, of like that prodigal father. There's a longing, but there's a longing that recognizes that you can't impose, mm-hmm. you can't, um, shame someone into conversion, mm-hmm. uh, and you can't appeal to the law to someone who's already outside the law. Mm-hmm. It, none of those have any effect. <laughs> the mm-hmm. only effect when we've already experienced the mercy and we want to love God more. Mm-hmm. Well, this is why this hurt. This is why you don't do this. This is how you love God. Mm-hmm. This is how you love one another. That's to the converted and the constant conversion. But to someone who's coming back, we have to find a way to first encounter them in a human way that they haven't encountered before. Well, wouldn't the, um, if that were true, wouldn't it be the case that uh, excommunicating someone would always be a bad idea? Because presumably you're excommunicating them because they're in a grave state of sin or are causing scandal. Wouldn't, by your logic, wouldn't you be like, well, you shouldn't kick them out because they wouldn't care because they're already in a sense out. I had, but obviously I, I think excommunication is a, a great idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I'm actually a big fan of it, yeah, actually. I wish it was used more. I do too. Yeah. And I think the excommunication, though, historically... Even, yeah, right, even he's understood medicinally. And that's, that, what and it, that, that's what you're saying. And that's the, that's the learning curve. So the learning curve of, of the medicinal effect of excommunication can't be done in a public statement alone. Yeah. It has to be done, as you hear with some of these good bishops do. I have had conversations with them private. I've spoken to them. We have, we've dialogued about this, and I have told them such and such and such and such. You know, so it's, it's, the, it's the, uh, the announcement is not necessarily the excommunication or the, the, the core of what's happening, that we all know about it. It's more it's of, both. it's primarily the encounter Because the announcement the has to be made for the good of the church. Oh, that's the whole point. And, and that's the whole point yeah. of the excommunication, that public scandal was made, yeah. that a confusion is possible. And as an ordained minister, particularly as a bishop with the full priestly authority, I have the, the responsibility mm-hmm. to match the public scandal with the public clarification. Yeah. Right? Not yep. to under, not to yeah, over, yeah. right? Eye for an eye. So if you call this amount of public confusion and scandal, it is my duty to clarify to that level, a proportional level. Yeah. I'm, that's absolutely. I think what we're seeing is the inability to reach the proportionality because mm-hmm. of, you know, vitriol dialogue, but also the recognition that the excommunication is only medicinal if it's personal. The, the medicinal part of it has mm-hmm, to be, maybe. if it's about, if it's about, the, the, the offender, right? The person who's offended. You have to, a dual responsibility, right? To the public who has been harmed mm-hmm. and hurt by yep. the public witness of someone contrary to the faith. So that medicinal effect is what the public announcement is. Like, hey yep. people, you saw this, I saw it too. Here's what really is happening. Mm-hmm. So that's the one wound okay. and the other med- medicine. The other is the offender, right? Mm-hmm. The particular one, whether it's a politician, whether it's someone of prominence that had that public forum, mm-hmm. and it's that meeting with them, or at least attempting with the meeting with them and saying, here's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Because what that gives is the right proportion of the personal versus the objective. Yeah. And the universal, if we don't have the personal, then it's the church imposing, and that narrative adds to the scandal. Okay. In our culture, that narrative adds to the scandal. But to the proportion that I can sit down with someone and I can say, whether they agree or not, I'm not talking about sitting down to convince them. That's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. But to be very clear, said so Mr. Mr. Fred. Mr. Cuomo. The Senator, Senator, yes, I, I, here's, here's, here's where we are. Mm-hmm. I am the, uh, the, the bishop of this diocese. And I'm here to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. This is the, the triple munor of being a, a priest. Mm-hmm. And what you have done has made it difficult for our believers to understand the fullness of this. And it's up to me because of the entrusted Uh, care of people to make it very clear to them about what the truth is, not just what your opinions are. Now, as far as your opinions here, here is the, here is where is what is true and here is what is not true. Mm -hmm. And it's up to me to make very clear to you that what you're suggesting may play publicly, but here is where you're out of step. And I'm not trying to play the role of a bishop and tell a bishop what to do, right? But in terms of, in terms of excommunication, Mm. the power in that is to shake that the person to be like, well, this is important enough that I am, I am a threat to the, to you know, to the to the beliefs of others. I can lead yeah, people away from it. Yeah, soul is in peril too. Right, and as I am out of step with the church, the church has a duty to call that out yeah. and to separate me further until right. I can come back 
and yeah. to be healthy. And, and to separate you whether or not you'll come back. I mean, it is meant to be medicinal. It has to be in freedom. But it's not like, well, you're not going to come back. Well, then I'll bring you back in. No, it has to be in freedom. There has to be that personal sense of... Because, I mean, if you're someone like uh, that Cuomo bloke up in New York who's mm. sort of celebrating the butchering of children up to mm. nine months of pregnancy, you, you've left the church. You've turned from Christ well before that point. So the public universal needs to equal in proportion yeah. what he's doing publicly. It bothered me that people got hung up on whether it's uh, you know, Dolan's jurisdiction to, to excommunicate him. I mean, well, okay, well, let's say um, by canon law, because what do I know? I'm not a canon lawyer. You can't actually technically excommunicate him for something like that. What about a strongly manly worded letter? Like, you will go to hell, and so will you're leading others to hell as well. Why don't we have more like that? I would rather have, I would rather have, I would know that I've had three meetings. I, I went to Albany, you know, and I've had these meetings with him. I made it very clear to him, this is what we teach. Your witness is contrary to this. And I, for, for the good of your soul, right. this is what, this is where you need to, to deepen your We just your said the same thing. Yeah, you you just did. sounded nicer. <laughs> okay, what do you mean? Don't you think? I do, I do but yeah. I think I, I'm, I was adding to yours was more public, right? So yeah. that letter, those letters always get public for some reason. They always end up in the New York Times. They end up in the, yeah. in the, in the you know, the, the, the diocesan Let newspaper. Them. Let them. Oh, and I agree with yeah. you. But I'm saying the, the, the complementary part to that has to be the personal yeah. appeal to their own salvation. I agree, yeah. And then the letter becomes, again, medicinal to the public side, whereas the meeting and the yeah, appeal yeah, yeah. is like, I'm not using a letter from New York City sent to Albany to try to save your soul. Mm -hmm. that, that's a cop-out to me. Just like the personal encounter without the public letter. It would be better than nothing. It, it would be. But we, did, we got neither, I don't think. Or we get either or, which, which, is, no, which is no No, better. I don't think we got either. All we got was we're really sad that this happened and there was no kind of manly what? language. On, oh, no, agreed, agreed. Yeah, no disagreement. No, 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 it's no wonder that people are turning so, to Voris so, and others who are like, would somebody just say it like it is? Yeah, yeah. There's a, definitely an understanding to what that uh, firm conviction clarity um, and and just say things as they are and that's going to gain popularity that's as why we my in interview office. with timothy gordon though was terribly nervous about releasing mm. right because he's very <laughs> abrasive and bombastic well he's very he's very direct he's, he's very, very direct and i love him and his family they're beautiful he's a terrific dad but he says things very differently to how i would say them yeah so whether he's right in expressing himself the way he did or not isn't my point the point is there seems to be a hunger for that clarity yeah there is, there is, and I, I wanted to go through the, the 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 screen there when he was talking about Ephesians five. But what I, did I, you want to do? Strangle him? Is that what that oh, was? Oh no, 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 like no. I wanted to get, I wanted to put myself into the conversation. <laughs> I wanted to be there yeah. to clarify what he thought was. I mean, that whole yeah. mutual submission thing and his, you, you know, like disdain. That? I think it's a misreading of JP two, and you hinted at it. I heard you say you, you yeah. said, well, whether it's JP two or, or whether your interpretation of what you think JP two has said. I mean, yeah. you, you 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 lampshaded it. Enough for me to continue. What's this phrase, lampshaded? I haven't heard that um, before. It's like, you know, um, I say something and I want to be bright lighted oh, at you, but then I, I, dull, I, but I, I, I cover it and I say, well, you know, I know you don't mean to do this and, and, and I know you don't mean to do this, but you know what? You're a jerk, <laughs> you know, oh, okay. but I don't mean the jerk in the sense of this. I mean more in the sense of, you know, you, okay. you, it's, it, it's like, I don't want the you, brightness you of my, it. you dulled the yeah, attack you or wanna, the you punch. Wanna, yeah, yeah. You want to make sure. And the other, other strategy is to, is to address you know, all the objections uh, and then make my point, right? Uh, so those are all like wimpy strategies for not wanting to be, not wanting to be offensive. The, yeah, but offend. the point is, I think like his popularity is gonna skyrocket precisely because he's like that for good mm -hmm. or ill. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with people like Miley Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro and all these other people. And I wouldn't put them all in the same category. I think You're talking strategy. different people have different amount, levels of nuance and I appreciate the nuance, but people seem to really want some bloody one to say something that's true and to not pussyfoot about it. Yeah, and I think there, we have to be, you know, and when you've got 50, there's good and bad about it. When you've got 50% of Catholics not accepting the, the, the teaching of the church and the Eucharist, we can't keep pretending this is a recent phenomena problem. It's like, yeah, there's been, like, there's been systematic it harm that is tagged. So again, this may church. be my bias because this is, this is the field I've been, I've been called to a ministry. I see everything as a family problem. And I think knowing in your heart, like deeply knowing that this is the body, but this is Christ. And that formula of body, blood, soul, and divinity mm -hmm. is just an objective way of getting to the reality. Like, this is Matt. This is Matt Fred, body, mm -hmm. blood, soul, and divinity, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's different sacramentally, but, but, <laughs> but, but you know, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. there's, a, there's a knowing that I'm in the presence of God. 
not in a symbol of God, mm. not in some you know highly recognized symbol of God, not in some church, but this is God, this is Jesus Christ. So the formula is meant to serve that, but how do you get to know someone? How do you instill that knowledge of God? Mm -hmm. And in the normative formation of the person, it's in the day-to-day, -day, it's in the, the air and the water, it's in the conversation, it's in the, yep. in the dull down times of the family and in the moments of acute mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, catechesis that this becomes like, this is God. The six-year-old, the seven-year-old who, who kneels when he, as soon as he comes into a church, yeah. who knows when he crosses the altar, yeah. you know, that he stops, doesn't do that drive-by kneel, you know, <laughs> just, just stops because, yeah. you know, there's someone here. That's how you build a wonder, a fascination, and then a reverence. Okay. So my point is, you know, yeah, if the end is 50% of Catholics or more don't believe in the real presence of Christ, that's not a dial up the catechesis dial. That may be the dial Why up. Why not? Why isn't it? I mean, partly the problem is because the catechesis have been so lousy. Hasn't that been a big contributing factor it, to people not believing the Eucharist? Yes, but the catechesis isn't to the non-believer. The catechesis has to be to the normative forms of formation. So the father, the mother, who in the domestic church mm -hmm. are raising someone to recognize that, not by more teaching, but by example and by live, by Why their not deeper by knowing. More teaching? This because is what I'm saying to you. Like, it, you say don't dial up the catechesis. And part of me gets what you're saying because there's a relational part that's lacking maybe. But a lot of people say, no, you don't understand. We had no formation. We weren't taught the catechism. We absolutely need people to ramp up the catechesis. Because I think there's a difference between, and, and there's a difference between knowing something and believing something, right? Mm -hmm. And catechesis in terms of the, I looked at catechesis as presuming belief. Mm -hmm. We catechize because we presume belief. Once you believe in Christ, you want to know more and you want to know more. Why is this and what's the relation between that? To me, evangelization, which is inseparable from catechesis, is more of why should I believe? You know, why should I believe? I don't even know that I fully believe yet. Mm -hmm. So you speak differently when you presume non-belief oh, than yeah. you do when you presume belief. So by catechizing in my vocabulary, it's speaking to someone presuming belief. You ought to know this. This is God. This is the body, blood, and soul, divinity of Christ. This is sin. And in my experience, saying those things to the non-believer is like they're blinking at you like, like, I, I honestly, I'm not rejecting you. I just, I have, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, okay. I, I'm, and, and I see it's very important to you. But why can't, And you're yelling louder. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> well, but why, why, why can't a good catechesis just mean teaching the truth in a convincing way? Like teaching the Catholic faith in a convincing way. If you broaden that, then I agree with you. But okay. I would say that when you move to that convincing way, you're talking about evangelization. You speaking in a way that you don't presume belief. So I'm going to talk about why you should believe. Okay. And the power of why you believe is is. Well, to help explain why you say you believe this, because I think there's a lot of Catholics who are like, "Yeah, I believe in the Assumption of Mary." Like, and in the catechesis could also be explaining what the church exactly. means by that. Exactly. But notice how that explaining presumed that they already believed it. So that's well, exactly what yeah. I was saying earlier. That you say, "I believe in in the bodily assumption of Mary." Okay, what does it mean when you teach? Ah, now we're into catechesis. Mm -hmm. When somebody says, "Oh, well, my service does bread and wine every third Sunday too," so maybe it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Is it? No, this is this is uh, the evangelization would be when Christ came. He didn't want to leave us. And if God can do anything in terms of wanting to be with us always to the end of the time, he didn't just bring yeah. the Holy Spirit to be the author and the guide of truth, but he wanted to be with us always. Mm -hmm. And he did what only God could do, is to be present with us in such a real way that He would we would never feel alone, we would never be alone, that we would have a sure path through his bride to heaven, right? So we're preparing the tilling the soil of saying, why would God want to be here in a, in a piece of bread and wine you know, why, why, why are you saying that this ritual is somehow more special than somebody else's ritual? Mm -hmm. So there's an evangelization, there's an appeal to the heart that then says, well, then, well, well why then does, and you know there's some Catholic answers, you usually get somebody who says, well, why? Now you got an open new catechize. Mm. So that, that evangelization becomes, whether you call it catechizing and giving them the why, mm -hmm. I just categorize that as an evangelization so that we can move into real catechesis, so that we can okay. catechize, we can echo the deepest truths of what God has revealed through his, through his church. But I think a lot of the catechesis we get now is, is then what people want to dial up is just the stuff. Just tell people, this is Christ. It's I a see. body, blood, soul, divinity. Say it. Yeah. It's a body, blood, <laughs> say it. That's the formula. Say it. It's yeah. the body, blood, soul, and divinity. Okay, next subject. What about the... Yeah. And, and I don't want to paint too broad a brush, <clears throat> but I also don't want to give a, uh, get off the hook that evangelization is 
a lot messier than catechesis. Mm -hmm. It's a lot messier in my experience, in my experience, I'll couch it. And so you're not saying either or. No. Because you can't believe in what you don't know. Exactly. So pitting knowing against believing, say, or knowing. No, it's no sense. I'm yeah. Catholic. We both hand. Yeah, so you, we but, both hand. But if you've got if you've got multiple weapons in here, this is like a man saying, right? We got a, <laughs> if we have a bat belt. I right? love that you just compared catechesis. <laughs> this is a, whatever. Because well, I'm a guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the you know the bazookas on this hip, yeah. right? And then I've got you know a Bowie knife over here. Yeah. You got to know when to use the knife. Yeah. You got to know what kind of All round. Right. Yeah. So in that sense, when you're with when you're encountering somebody, you got to know: Does this guy need a catech uh, catechism reference? Yeah. Or is he really asking why? Why should I believe this? Yeah. And if you give one wrong or the other, That's fair. Th they'll go, interesting, and yeah. then move on. Yeah, yeah, or they'll yeah. go, whoa, well, that means that this is this. Yeah. So then what about that? Yeah. That's that's what I'm making the distinction yeah, between and knowing and believing. Yeah, that's what Bishop Robert Barron does so well. Because when you say he appeals to the heart, that can sound rather sentimental, mm -hmm. but it isn't. Because the heart just means you. That's what the, the heart deepest is. Deepest part of deepest who you part are. Deepest part of who you are. So when we say he appeals to the heart, we're saying he's appealing to you and where you are at, as opposed to just... Yeah, listing off a bunch of and stuff. He, and, he, and he uses beauty in a way we haven't seen before, um, recently, I shouldn't say it's seen before, but he uses different mediums to, to I think, uh, leverage the power of evangelization and beauty, right? Whether it's the cathedrals or whether it's the flowery language or the reading of quotes from saints that, that you know, ignite the imagination mm -hmm. as much as they do the intellect. Right, because he could mm -hmm. he could talk very specifically, and he does often about you know very intellectual, mm -hmm. you know, Thomistic, uh, you know, points and differences with Augustine, and you know, and those are nice, those are good, and it, those evangelize in the transcendental of truth, right? But I think he leverages the other transcendental of beauty in a way, whether it's in video, whether it's mm -hmm. in um, popular movies or music, and yeah. and that's 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 good for another segment who isn't, you know, naturally aligned to being converted with truth directly and ideas, but more of just the encounter of beauty and of, and of goodness and being like, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. So there's a wonder and a sort of a, a fascination, I think, that he exudes. Yeah. That's very- Agreed. Very, very attractive. All right, so you've spoken on sex and sexuality and natural family planning for years now to countless couples. Yes. So I need to ask you this. Uh -oh. How does a husband and wife have a good, beautiful sex life? Ooh. I mean, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know but, if you know. <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want to know, like, how do we, how do we do this? You know, um, I, I, I've joked, but it's really the truth. I, I, I found myself in this in this ministry around sex sexuality because it's my brokenness. This is the this is the wound of me of um, you know beginning in, actually earlier, but really beginning in college and and trying to make sense of things, but just being an idiot and just you know figuring I can self create and do whatever I want. And I say eating the hook line and sinker of you know I thought you know back in the day the movie Animal House was a, was a uh, a documentary on what college life was, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, here we go, right? And at some point you mature and then, you know, Blutowski becomes a senator, you know? That's, yeah. a, that's how that movie ended, yeah. right, right? Um, but to your question, I think sex is a comprehensive reality. And what I mean by that is it's not just a linear thing. Like you do this, 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 and this, you have a great sex life. It's not just biological. Right, but it is. It's not just relational, but it is. It's not just um, you know reproductive or uh, cultural in terms of society. It's not just the way we dress. It's comprehensive in that it literally touches every element of the human person and culture, identity, relationships, mission, how I live my life, how I dress, how I approach people of the same or opposite sex, uh, how I view my role in reproduction, uh, receiving as a patrimony from the history of the five, uh, of of casting into the future you know, the, the, the cosmos and who I, who I have sex with. As our actions betray our identity, we act in a way with, in accord with who we think we are. Mm -hmm. Sex is so powerful in terms of our identity, of our relationships and our mission, both with God and with others, that to get it wrong is catastrophic. Yeah. It's catastrophic. And if you take that same power to the negative, to get it right, is cosmologically and it, it's it's um, it is a uh, I'm trying to think of something really profound to say in the opposite of destruction, right? It it, it bloody good. It's 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 the original blessing. 
It's the primordial blessing. This is why, you know, being created male and female, Genesis 1, 27, seeing the original nakedness, the original unity, and the original solitude in Genesis chapter 2 between Adam and God and Adam and Eve. Um, this is way before morality. This is before the church. This is before, you know, formal worship and yeah. commandment. It's primordial. It's first order. So approaching sex in, within marriage is sort of that calculus level math question that we first have to get the grammar and the numeracy, mm -hmm. the literacy and numeracy, and learn about algebra, learn about it in order to get to the calculus one. And what it means is that the expression of our, of our sexuality within marriage, particularly for Christians, is inseparable from our identity with Christ and our identity as a man and as a woman. So we take sex and the whole comprehensive reality and we say, first, it's, it's, it's who we are, male, female. It's a noun, mm -hmm. right? To be male, female is a noun. Then it moves into a, a sexual attraction, right? Mm -hmm. And then that use, usually leads to a sexual union, mm -hmm. right? I'm not talking morality at all. I'm just talking about human sense. Sexual difference, sexual attraction, sexual union. That sexual union has the power to create a new life a person who never existed before, who will live eternally. As the fruit of the union of two sexually dimorphic people who are attracted to one another and engage in a very human act. So we're starting to build sort of a, a wonder. <laughs> I Am love I with the, you? This is gonna be a cutout bit on YouTube. How to have a good sex life. Like, all right, all right, keep going. <laughs> Oh, did you want the seven ways to make it? Uh, right no, but here's though. I mean, the, pro the problem with Cosmo is they <laughs> they make up with technique what they lack in intimacy. Exactly. Yeah. They've reduced it to a biology. They've reduced it to a self creation. So their whole sexual uh, category is is deeply within. Uh, we're alone. It's about me. I can self create. I can create my own past, present, or future. Mm -hmm. That is an entirely different anthropology the human person than what Christ and God has revealed. Because everything that he has revealed is that we are not on our own, we are not self-created. Mm -hmm. We're created deliberately intentionally by God that our very bodies speak the fact that we don't even know who we are outside of relation to another person. Being mm -hmm. made male, yeah. this body of ours, brother, makes no sense yeah. if there were no such thing as woman. Yeah, It makes no sense. Yeah, we can breathe because we've got a fully complete you know, respiratory system, system, respiratory system. We've got, we can feel because a, a complete, you know, separate uh, nervous. nervous system, mm -hmm. right? And we can do it except for one major system. Mm -hmm. There's a major system in our body that makes absolutely no sense in and of itself because it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not just being cute here. If we started from the beginning and want to know the why behind the what, just look at what reality is. What's the nature of this? What is the is is, the isness? And it turns out that the, the reproductive system is only half complete, whether you're talking about the genitals or whether you're talking about the genetics or whether you're talking about genealogy of families or you're talking about you know, uh, gender. All these things speak about the need for identity, relationship, and communion to even know who we are. Okay. Right? Which is the definition of love. So we're made for communion, which is a particular type of love. So th this is the ecosystem. So if we're gonna talk about sex within marriage, yeah. let's follow the same script that our family album starts with. There was nothing. God created through separation for communion. Light, dark, mm -hmm. sun, moon, all the male, female. It's Genesis 2. God develops the sonship of this new man, Adam, and when he is ready, he lays him down into sleep for a second creation to create an other that when he sees at a first gaze without a word, says this one at last is mm -hmm. bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That's the poetry of this one is just like me, but different. And that sexual difference, that sexual uh, union and attraction now creates something together that can't exist on its own. This is how the Christian understands sex. That John Paul II would say that the reverence between a husband and a wife, what is reverence? Hmm. but a spiritually mature form of the mutual fascination of the sexes. Say that again. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. He says, what is reverence, mm -hmm. but a spiritually mature form of the mutual fascination of the sexes? Wow. And I've, I've dared to expand that a bit. Like when we re re revere God, when we, uh, the reverence for the Eucharist, the reverence for the church, the mm -hmm. reverence for liturgy, 
uh, is that not a spiritually m- mature form of fascination and wonder mm. and awe? So as a little six-year-old, you say, that's God. When mm-hmm. the bell rings, yep. and you say, we've all done this, right? Say, that's God, Jesus is here now. Mm-hmm. It's not bread anymore. Mm-hmm. And the six-year-old goes, wow. They have no idea what you're talking about, but they go, wow. Mm-hmm. There's a wonder there that God willing in past the age of reason, it goes, it goes from a wow to a whoa oh, reverence, right? So imagine that reverence between man and woman. We're still talking about sex here. Yeah, uh, good, okay. We're still talking about sex. Because <laughs> it's about to ask you how to have a good <laughs> sex life. So get yeah. going. You know, it's the fourth grader asking a calculus question, brother. You gotta you gotta follow all the way through the algebra. Okay. Otherwise, there's no context. This is it, then it becomes humana vitae dropped in 1968, and people are going, uh, and it took six, eight, ten years later for John Paul II to create this theology of the body to provide the context for humana vitae. That makes sense, yeah. So what we're talking about here, we ask a question about sex within marriage. What you're really asking is, why should I care? What does it have to do with me? And is there anything objective that I need to know in order for my subjective marriage to be all that it can be? That's yeah. how I hear the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the backstory is we're made sexual. Yep. God created us with a desire and a longing one for the other. Not just male, female, which is the highest icon of that on earth created, but even as friendship. And as, as neighbor, who is your neighbor, right? All these things were made for one for the other. But so they wouldn't be abstract, he created us male and female. So stamped right into our bodies is this reality that we don't even make sense alone. How can I self-create? Mm-hmm. How can I be all that I can be? It's like a little atoms bouncing around, an atomistic single worldview. No, we come to know who we are. Life is incomprehensible. If we love is not revealed, mm-hmm. If it's not experienced, right? John Paul II and the Redeemer of Man, his first encyclical, that love is deeply communal. And sex is the primordial revelation of the deepest mystery of God. That God himself is not even a solo. That God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and neither one is the Holy Spirit. But the Father is God, the Son is God, Mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit is God. We could not have made this up because that's as far as most of us can get, right? But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are this dynamism of communion. Let us make man in our image and likeness, Mm -hmm. instantiated in a material world, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the earth and subdue it. This replies not just a, a difference from, but a difference for. So our sexuality is a sign, even as it's a reality. It's a sacrament small s. It's a sacrament that says this is a sign of something and leading us to something even greater in God. So the sexual desire leading to sexual union, leading to children is all the context to understand marriage. Mm -hmm. That marriage is an act of freedom to say, yes, I choose that. I choose to order my life for this particular other so that we together can become what we cannot be on our own And as the full revelation, that's natural marriage, when Christ raised marriage to the dignity of a sacrament, this is the teaching of our faith, that Christ said, we're gonna take this natural good and I'm gonna show you how this is actually a sign of heaven itself. That I am the head, you are the body, that together we make one person, right? And that one person is in the union of Christ and the church. Mm-hmm. Am I losing you? I just want to know how to have a good yeah, sex life. I know right? you do. I know you do. No, I, mean, this is a, I mean, this is all good, but there's someone out there who've just got married and they're trying to figure this out and they can't do it. And they love each other. Yes. And they're good friends. Yes. I'm not asking you for tips and techniques. I'm just asking, like, give us a little more practical. Practical. <laughs> Review. No, 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 I'm with you. I'm you with you. I'm with that? you. No, no, I absolutely agree okay. with you. See, the, the, what I'm reacting to is, is the the dearth of the story and you talk about the growth and all of these other s- people who are filling the vacuum of clear teaching there's also a vacuum of the why behind the what of sex mm-hmm. and that's being filled by all these the whole sexual health books these sexual coaches that are online yeah. there's a whole industry of seven ways to make your marriage great by doing this position, yeah, 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 by yeah. doing this. So there's a, I'm, I'm reacting to that, no, I'm allergic good. to it. Okay. So when I get that question, I get it often. 
I go as far as I can with what I think the person can see. So I, you're right. I wasn't answering to the to the viewer. Yeah. So it was just bad on me. I was talking to say. No, it's all very fascinating for sure. So not knowing the questions that our beautiful people are actually asking, yeah. it's hard to get right to the question. So yeah. you say, don't go to the extreme of seven ways to make your marriage great. But also don't give me the theology of marriage when yeah. I ask you how to make my marriage great. Well, everywhere in between. Well, no, the seven ways might be okay, but I, I guess I'm just, I, I'm not talking about like the, 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 the vulgar and sort of despicable crap printed on Cosmo. I'm yeah. not talking about that. Yeah. But I mean, even like, <clears throat> I think like one thing that I would say is like friendship is required for a good sex life. Mm -hmm. It's very basic. No, 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 no. But to have a deep and intimate friendship and to reverence my wife as my sister in the Lord and my friend who I love and who I want the good for. All right, what else? There's one thing. Yeah. Um, I would still go to the principle of really understanding how sex is an expression of a particular kind of love, being conscious of and this. And I also love what conscious. you said. So I also love what you said about like sex being all encompassing. Mm hmm. Um, and, and then, like, and another thing I've heard said, which I think is a great tip, if you want, is, like, um, who, who said this? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. I, I'm going to butcher it if I try it. But, but like, to, to, to love my spouse throughout the day. Yes. And not just, like, so, almost like sex doesn't just stay in the bedroom. It's, like, you how you serve your wife and your husband. So what we say, what Melanie and I teach is that it's both descriptive of where your relationship is and it's also reparative of where your relationship wants to go. So mm, everything like that's it. happening during the day and during your relationship is gonna show up in spades. Mm -hmm. You know, were you cool to each other? Did you not attend to one another's needs? And then all of a sudden you have a desire for sex. There you go. And then, you know, one of you is angry because you know there's something just out of order here. There you if, go, in yeah. many ways, just in a certain sense, it's like receiving the sacrament unworthily. Yeah, yeah it is. So there's an internal conviction that's that it. says something's not right. Yeah. But if, if, if there's a particularly a break in the relationship, like you have fought mm -hmm. and yet you know for whatever reasons you know you still want to have sex with each other right mm -hmm. intimacy and you try to have that intimacy without the reparation beforehand right both of you know something's off it's like communion you, before oh, confession it's a, it's a similar thing. precisely but there's different ways right there's the, the venial sin which is sort of the cooling off and the and you know it kind of brings oh, wow we, we should be we've been really apart from each other and now i really see and feel like we've really missed i've missed you i've mm -hmm. missed you so it can be repairing even as it reveals the previous coolness that you brought in. If it's completely break, like a you know mortal separation, yeah, yeah. and you try to come together, it's nothing but a conviction in your heart. You've used me. Mm -hmm. I feel used. I know I you know I consented presumably, but I feel used. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is what's meant to be convicting. It's a guilt, not a shame yet, but a guilt that says something's not right, and we have to work forward. So in that ways, it is a reparative. Uh, it is. Um, the uh, what's the phrase that we used to use about the the, the meaning of the marital act in that it's a, a remedy for concupiscence, right? Mm -hmm. And I've I've, and I've this is Paul. This, it's it's Paul. It's it's um, Thomas you know, Aquinas in his discussion on the marital debt. But what does that mean? So even that language, right? The debt is offensive right now, even though the truth is truth. But that we're same thing with re remedy for concupiscence. You yeah. know, people have misread that. Yeah. In my opinion, to say you can well, you're worry about it exactly with your body, but not with yourself. Exactly. But as long as you do it with your wife, it's, yeah. it's it yeah. that's not it. It's, it's, sealed, it's yeah. relational, and the relational reality that remedy, it's remediating, literally bringing back together, the disordered uh, view of my of my sexuality. That my masculinity is not ordered for the good of my wife and for our family. It's been ordered in other places. Mm -hmm. So to remediate within marriage means to come back together re-willing, re-proposing uh, uh, to be a free, total, faithful, and fruitful self-gift. And sometimes it's very conscious, and you have to make that decision. Sometimes it's subconscious, and it actually, the act in and of itself is procreative. And as long as we don't do anything to actively make it non-procreative, mm -hmm. this is the great gift that God has given within marriage to, to come back to. It's like the Eucharist, you know, and the Eucharist in a greater sense, but in a very a powerful sense, more than people realize, that communion within marriage of the sexual embrace is meant to renew, literally represent the wedding vows uh, to um, you know, promise related, to be a gift one to the other. Mm -hmm. So continuing with your practical list. No, this is good so far. Okay. This is good. I like it. That friendship piece plays <coughs> out in, in, in um, wounds that you have seen and that you haven't seen. I felt this way, but I don't want to accuse you of this. But, you know, throughout the day, I didn't feel like Dialogue, you were attempted yeah. to me. And I feel like you're uh, more concerned with your work than you were with me today. Yeah, it's or, so important to kind of uh, talk. 
it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because we all, we internalize things. We That look that you gave me, that thing that you did, and I thought this, and I, yes. I made an agreement about you regarding this. Mm. Um, it's so important that we continually communicate so that we're on the same page. Yeah. And most things are not even in the present, which is what has been a shocker for me in terms like those wounds and those hurts and those assumptions within the marriage. They end up being sort of the things that gin up pretty old mm. memories. You know, when you looked at me that way, when you didn't answer when I said this, when you didn't answer the phone or when I asked you this and you said, mm-hmm, you know, it just, it just, it just, it just, you know, yeah. and there's something in Part our past. Part of having the language to say it. Like it's this language of healing, like mm-hmm. understanding our int- interior life, how we respond to certain things, what what we believe about ourselves, given mm-hmm. a certain thing. It's almost like the better you can get at articulating your interior world, yeah. the better you can communicate it to the other. And yeah. One thing my wife and I have found very helpful because of serving with NET Ministries. Mm. Uh, on NET, you live in close quarters and are encouraged, of course, to reconcile with each other when you've hurt each other. Crucial but, conversations. Uh, is that what they call them? We call them uh, conflict resolutions. I think they're called different things. Focus in, missionaries call them. Uh, yeah. We need to have a crucial conversation. Crucial. Right? This one's <laughs> crucial. So, but we would have the languages. When when you did this, I, you know, I thought you meant this, and I felt like this. But the, 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 the point is, like, um, the, the language is, please forgive me. I forgive you. And it's so simple, but it's amazing how many people don't do that. No. So it's not like, I'm sorry, oh, it's okay. Yeah. Because it's not, okay. it's not okay. It's not okay that you did that. Yeah. So my wife and I brought that into our marriage. Um, please forgive me. Mm. I forgive you. Mm. Or, if, or if I'll do something, I'm like, okay, like, I'm sorry. It's like, are you going to ask my forgiveness? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please, you know, or vice versa. Yes. We have the kids do that with each other as well. Like, I'm sorry. No, no. What else? You know, like, please forgive me. Mm. And then I forgive you. And that kind of language is really helpful too. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So the thing that popped in my head when you said that too was um, that one of the specifically around marital a marital intimacy, marital sex is uh, something Janet Smith talked about in her translation of Humanae Vitae, and she says it's what's what's described and translated in English as responsible parenthood. Mm. You've seen that phrase thrown around, right? It's true, but the the the, the deeper her, her take on it, which I think is more more. Um, appropriate, more instructive, I should yeah, say, yeah, yeah. is conscious parenthood. Hmm. And that means not that every time we come together, we're going to have a baby, right? Yeah. Not, not, not that willful, but a conscious, like, this is how we express life and love. Mm-hmm. This is this is uniquely and particularly and exclusively marital. And being conscious of that takes that banality away from what could be just a mutual pleasuring or yeah. a release or desire for pleasure, which we all are, are um, you know, susceptible to, that the conscious parenting means that when we do come together, it may not be the willful decision to have or not to have a child, but just the acknowledgement that this is how new life comes into existence. And we yeah. have this together, we have this capacity, this kapox, this call from God to do mm. that. I think it elevates, her point is that it elevates the nobility of the embrace, no matter, you know, however it happens. What about happens. for those who are infertile or where the wife has had a uh, hysterectomy because of health issues and things like that? Yeah, like, do you and, still have that intention? Not you're... only that, I think it actually makes, it, it, it opens up, it opens it up further to couples dealing with that, 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 that crisis in that we can only go so far in our procreative reality. We think that because we don't have a diagnosed fertility issue, that we're in the fertile age, that every time we come together, we're going to have a baby, right? It's this false illusion that every engaged couple at marriage yeah. prep has, right? Like, yeah. how long do we wait before we have kids? Yeah. Not realizing one of six is going to have a, a fertility issue. Mm. And that even if you don't, every active intercourse isn't intended to achieve pregnancy. Mm-hmm. It's only a 12 to 24 hour window every cycle where it's even biologically possible. Yeah. So there's something else at play here that says, Conscious parenting means that we can only go so far, and that is in the mutual self-gift. What happens after that literally is up to God, fertile or not, you know, premenopausal, postmenopausal, or in the middle of your fertile time. Are we given the gift in accord with the pledge that we made to each other? That's why the the marital act, sexual act, is procreative whether or not we have children. Mm -hmm. The act in and of itself is procreative. Very good, yeah. So this opens up the whole reality that your biological fertility is a further expression of what God will do when the gift is made. Do you know, um, I, this was 
I was coming home from a date night recently and my wife uh, and I were talking about the marital debt and we were reading Thomas Aquinas. She was reading it to me in the car. We were on a date night. She's reading me. <laughs> I'm sure it was very Thomas Aquinas. For you. <laughs> it was for me. Like, this is fantastic. <laughs> I wrote this in my head. <laughs> but exactly. But um, Aquinas, uh, interestingly enough, alludes to the twofold end of the sexual act. Mm. Um, because one of the questions that he addresses in the Summa is whether or not a husband and wife should have sex when she has her period. Hmm. And he says no, but for bad scientific reasons, which, so it makes the answer. He basically says, Jerome says, the child will come out deformed or something like that. And he says, so since... Was that know, one of the answers or was that the primary response? Um, uh, well, there's two th points to it. So the first one is no, because like the, the, the principal good of the sexual act is children. And so to engage in sexual relations that, that would lead to a deformed child would be an, an unloving act. Mm. But, he says, if it is due to a constant flow, so due to a sickness, so it's not the period, it's just bleeding, then you may because there isn't the possibility of the child. Mm. So right there mm. he's saying, he's acknowledging that there's a twofold end. Because I, I found sometimes that Catholics want to say, no, no, all this twofold end stuff is just John Paul II propaganda. Yeah. There's only one end, and it's the good of it's the good. Of it. mm. Interesting, eh? Yeah, processing. I think um, I'm going to look it up while we talk. Yeah, yeah. I think there there's always been this this ebb and flow, particularly in the last century, as we've really developed the theology of sex, thanks to John Paul II. But there's been this ebb and flow of both the the function the functionality of the marital embrace mm -hmm. and the human uh, the human good within marriage that that I don't want to say transcends doctrine, but it really enfleshes it. It enfleshes the doctrine when we see what the marital embrace can do within marriage. But if, when we focus too much on the end of a child, mm -hmm. when we speak about the goods of marriage, I think it's, we're setting ourselves up for a distortion um, because the child is a gift, right? Is the Holy Spirit, the author, the giver of life who discerns whether, you know, even a 23 chromosome oocyte and the 23 chromosomes of the sperm come together to make a new human person. Mm -hmm. It's, the, it's the, the formed body and the breath of God that makes that. So that's beyond us anyway. Beyond the gift given in the marital pledge and in the marital act, we have no say, no influence, no power in the end of a child coming. Right. But we do have power if we distort the gift or if we make the fullness of the gift. So contraception is a distorting of the gift, right? Uh, abortion is a rejection of, of the gift, <clears throat> right? And But allowing the act in and of itself to be what it is and not subscribing that we own what's gonna happen after yeah. that, that gives the, 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 the freedom yeah. to the fertility, the infertility, like the postmenopausal. And I, that's where I read humanity I really too. Like that. That's where I read John Paul II. Well, my wife had to have a hysterectomy due mm -hmm. to health reasons mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. So I like the idea that this is a procreative act. Thank you for sharing that with me. There's a beautiful book um, I endorsed years ago, and I, I think I did the forward for it. And it was about the testimony of three couples dealing with infertility, faithful Catholics, and trying to make sense of this exact this exact point. Yeah. And what I learned it's... from it, what I learned from that was one of the prime proofs, human proofs of, of that is having a child doesn't uh, heal the wound of infertility. Having a child does not heal the wound of infertility. This is their own witnesses. Whether it's ART, artificial reproductive technologies, or whether it's just the, 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 the receiving of a child, there's an, there's an a priori question that an infertile spouse needs answered whether or not the child comes in. And it's the flip of the question, will you love me for who I am? Mm. And they're articulating in a beautiful way in their own witness that the child doesn't answer that question. Will you love me if just I'm infertile? Yeah, if I'm infertile. Question? Will you love me and my infertility? The yeah. totality of who I am. It must be such a cross. Well, no, notice, no, no, notice the, how the flip side of that is with most in marriage prep, because that's where I come from. The fear, it's palpable in the room when we speak about natural family planning, mm -hmm. about understanding your fertility, about being stewards of your sexuality and this gift from God, about your muniness. I mean, yeah. all the stuff we put on, and couples are like, well, if sex is always about children, then, you know, what are we gonna do? And yeah. the fear is always, or the, at least the ministry is, will you love your wife and her fertility? Yeah. And not try to separate the two. Love it. Now in the infertility, it's the same question. 
will you love me for who I am and my infertility? Yeah. Or, or is it the child that now will make me useful? Very good. Oh, Let me read this to you. Please. Since I brought it up, and I know we're going to have a lot of people cocking their eyebrows here. <laughs> so let me, so he talks, he calls it menses. Is that how you say it? Yes. Menses. Yes. I have the menses. It's like <laughs> dropsy. Anyway, okay. Uh, let's see. So let, let me just kind of read it here. So he says, like, it's forbidden for two reasons, to have sex with your wife on her period, right? She, he says, both on account of her, um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Okay. For since marriage is chiefly directed to the good of the offspring, all use of marriage which is intended for the good of the offspring is in order. Consequently, this precept is binding even in the new law on account of the second reason, although not on account of the first, first being uncleanliness according to the old covenant. Mm. Now, the menstrual issue may be natural or unnatural. The natural issue is that to which women are subject at stated periods when they are in good health. And it is unnatural when they suffer from an issue of blood through some disorder resulting from sickness. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, if the menstrual flow be unnatural, it is not forbidden in the new law to approach to a menstruous woman, both on account of her infirmity, since a woman in that state cannot conceive. Do you see what he's saying? I do. So he's saying like, yeah, you can you can have sex if she's if it's an uh, not her period, but like a flow of blood. Yeah. Because precisely because, both uh, 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 of Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I don't know if I read all that there, but the, the point is, it, I, I'm not wrong. Uh, sometimes yeah. you you kind of resummarize it to Quran. It's like, uh, did he say that? But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm seeing that from the positive point of view because mm -hmm. I see some Catholics who would say that there's pro one end to the sexual act, which is children. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, not according to Thomas Aquinas, or else he would, uh, or else he would forbid sex even sure. in an un uh, unnatural flow of blood. Sure, sure. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. It does. I, I, I would. I don't. That's not my starting point. I'm always fascinated with what Thomas you know, says whether it you know, makes the magisterium or not. I'm always fascinated with it yeah. like you. And I'm okay disagreeing but, with him too. I just thought that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah it is. And I think it, it's in accord given the <coughs> development of doctrine, uh, particularly since you know, 11th century, you know, 10th century, 12th century, uh, the development of doctrine that gets more and more specific about how a married couple fulfills their wedding vows yeah. and what it is their, their, their munis, you know, their, 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 their role, task, mission, you know, high office in there. But if you look at where Thomas was building probably some Augustine and some other things, and you see what's come since then, mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you. There's no contradiction in what the magisterial teaching is here with what you just mm -hmm. stated, but it's woefully insufficient. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not even helpful to most because while it does answer, I think, that contested question about whether yeah. there's an absolute you know, negation of it. It doesn't answer the deeper questions about what is the meaning of sex. Yeah. And to that, we're not left alone. We have deep magisterial teaching, in particular in the last hundred and mm -hmm. you know, fifteen years, hundred and twenty years, that the church speaks about this growing understanding of what I would call more of that subjective, inductive, experiential that gives proof to the deductive. Yeah, so yeah. you read things like, you know, Casti Canubi, 1930, in the in the response to the Anglican Lambeth yeah. Conference and Contraception. And you have a structure that starts to take shape about the meaning of the sexual embrace. Mm. And again, it gives power, you know, more priority to the, to the children and others. And then you see this, what I think is an explosion of context and deeper understanding this, this of the Second Vatican this, Council this is about fascinating. This. I mean, this happens with all of our doctrines mm -hmm. when the church begins to identify them. Like the church had to clarify what we meant when we said Jesus is God and yes. there is one God and so there's a father. And so you have to kind of define that. And in defining it, you develop this whole theology uh, of, of the Trinity. Yeah. And so something similar is happening here in the moral a human realm Agreed. as we begin to talk about, well, if contraception's wrong, what is that? What, why? And what is sex? And what's the point of sex? And what does that mean? And each crisis, to your point, each crisis requires deeper clarification. You know, um, what, the, what Cassidy Canubi was clear about in the understanding of contraception in 1930 had no concept of hormonal contraception, mm. which is why the whole thing blew up again in the 50s, because this was, this could be interpreted differently. The mechanism of a hormonal contraceptive is conceivably different than it was with the barrier devices or with you know whatever that was available in 1930. Mm -hmm. So now we need further clarification because it's, well, wait a minute, now we're actually not changing anything. We're actually uh, 
uh, delaying the natural processes within the woman. We're not yes, changing anything. Yes, 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 yes. So you say, well, now you have to get more clear about Technically, it. we're good. Technically, Technically we're good. We're right? yeah, yeah. And then the whole relational piece came through about withholding a worthy gift, about not making the total gift to the self. Right. And to those who oppose the teaching, they're like, oh, we can never, you guys are just making stuff up as you go. Yes. How often do you hear that? Yeah. Somebody already disagrees with the teaching. <laughs> so the further clarification is not a clarification, it's an excuse. Mm -hmm. So you see this, 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 particularly in this in contraception and the sexual issues, these divided camps that, you know, for there's some, no matter what you say, it's never good enough. And no matter what you don't say, it'll never be satisfied. You know, so there's a, there's a sense that um, the clarification can still only be received uh, with faithful ears and with a faithful heart. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, back to that same other issue about, you know, understanding that um, uh, the relationship with Christ is what will be the, the clarifying uh, source, source of authority, that we love the church because Christ gave us the church, mm -hmm. right? And that he gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us in all matters of truth you know, and, and, and doctrine in, in the future. So it's not a matter of us understanding in order to believe it. It's must first saying, oh, okay, okay, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And then try, with that belief, deepening our understanding with, with the catechesis. But if we lean on the catechesis to give us belief, then you're going to find a loophole. You're always going to find that legal loophole. Yeah. You know? And um, I think individual couples are in dear, dire need of um, real intimate community because there are topics that we know, we deal with within our marriages that we're not even sure we can talk to other people about. Right? Yeah. Am I supposed to know this? Am I supposed to, you know, if I yeah. do something wrong? And even if we're faithful in terms of spiritual direction and with, with <clears throat> confession, there are realms of, um, I don't want to say expertise like it's a thing, but there's a realms of authority that we've been given uh, within marriage that we really need to counsel uh, another, another pole of mm -hmm. counsel uh, with each other as couples. We have the church, we have doctrine, we have a relationship with Christ. All of these are powerful. We can seek spiritual direction, layer. Or, or priest or religious, but there's a there's a charism, there's a grace within our marriages that uh, supporting one another provides another pole of of counsel to get specific, especially in those real deep subtle things within marriage. And there's always the danger that you know these poles become you know conflicting, and you know we came to this reasoning with our eight couples, but the church says this, so mm -hmm. we're so we have to be you know reverent in in finding. Uh, and deferential really to what the church teaches. But how does that live out in our marriage and family? And in that sense, um, you know, particularly in, in Joy to Be and Joy Forever after, you know, Melanie, our, our, our initiative, we're trying to build these communities of trusted, you know, groups and, and, and couples yeah. and families where there is a real friendship and trust confidence. Okay. And we can, we can reason together, you know, these great sources of truth. And we've lacked that. I think we've lacked yeah. that as a, as a church. As we begin to wrap up here, what would you point someone to if they wanted to learn more about the theology of the body? Because theology of the body takes on different expressions. It does. People try and explain it sometimes. You're like, okay, I don't really know. <laughs> so in a sentence, there you go. In one sentence, what is the theology of the body? The theology of the body is um, an introduction mm -hmm. to our identity as sons and daughters of God the Father and how we live that identity in a unique, but in a universally human way. Wow, so you, you didn't even mention sex once there. Yeah, because- That's my point though, yeah. like people have this misunderstanding, or maybe, mis I don't know, you tell me, a misunderstanding that it's all about sex. It's the second or third, it's tertiary, yeah. because yeah. you can't get to any of those questions until Before you Before you know to what you are. Exactly. Yeah, which is why when I asked you for advice on sex, <laughs> not me personally, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I got it, I got yeah. it, I got That's it. for after the But I, in fairness, in fairness, I just go back to that, because I feel bad I wasn't giving you your seven reasons. It, I would answer that question differently if you said, hey, Damon, I'm dealing with this, 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 and this. Right. How would I answer well, this? Well, this goes back to what you said in the very beginning of our interview, yeah. that you were like, you need to ask a question before you give an answer. That's it. So I Otherwise, love... I'm talking for my own sake. I'm yeah. making stuff up no, that I think point. sounds good. But what uh, what book would you recommend someone read? Or what CD set? Or what, tell me, like someone wants to know about the theology of the body, but they don't want to have to take a whole course in it. And they don't want to read that huge book that John Paul II wrote. Well, let me give me categories of answers because okay. I've done this a long time. Trust okay. me, this is worth it, right? Sure. If you are a theologian, if you have studied theology and philosophy, you need to pick up Theology of the Body. Mm -hmm. there, don't, do not take an interpretation uh, yet. Read those later. 
If you have read theology and philosophy, go right to the sources because John Paul is not just a philosopher, he's a poet. And there's turns of phrases, there's references to traditional objective, deductive, and principle that you're going to go, oh, and they're going to come to life. Cool. They're like the Ezekiel bones that start to dance, right? So I don't want to dismiss if you've got that background. If it intimidates you in terms of the language and the philosophy, then you use secondary and tertiary sources in order to build the confidence to get to that teaching. But you're still building the bridges to get to it. But you're collecting resources like, I love Christopher's book, right? Where it, even it's a Q&A, like the good, uh, news, yeah. good news of sex and marriage. Yeah. 150 questions about sex. You, you know, just get bite-sized things, keep it in the bathroom and read it, right? Or if you want to read um, Theology of the Body for Beginners, mm -hmm. um, Jason's got a great book, Theology of the Body in One Hour. Did you read it? I did. I, I reviewed it. I, I gave a you know testimony. I thought he did a great job. Wow. Um, Father uh, Percy. Father Percy. Uh, Anthony Percy. Yes, Aussie. Aussie. Melbourne, maybe. Yes. Fantastic book. Is it from Melbourne? I don't Theology know. Body Made Simple? Is that his book? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's been a year since I read it, but I loved it, loved yeah. it, loved it, loved it. If you're more... Um, Again, these are secondary and tertiary, so you can build confidence to get to the, yeah. to the main source. I love Emily Stimson. Emily Stimson. Yeah, she, these beautiful bones. And I found she's not only a great writer, very poetic, very, she's a mom, and she's just, she's just good. And she sees, helped to see the ordinary, the divinity, the quid divinium, the, you know, the, the, or, the divine and the ordinary. So I recommend these beautiful bones, uh, Emily Stimson. I'm gonna forget some friend of mine here. Um, Pat Coffin's book is oh, excellent on contraception, not I, specifically about theology of the body, of course. He but. set me up. I, he, he, that was one of my favorite books, right? And then he, he brings me up back when he was with Catholic Answers and to be on the show with them to talk about uh, natural family planning and contraception. <laughs> I was like, dude, you literally wrote, wrote the, the book. book. So <laughs> the, the book was called, uh, or maybe still is called, Sex au Naturel. Yes. But I'm not sure if he changed it. Oh, I hope not. not. I, I've known it as Sex au Naturel, yeah. right? And he's, he's Patrick he's, Coffin, just as contraception as book, check it out. Genius, yeah. because yeah. what he does is what I did with my EWTN series. I did 13 part series, went to history, biology, research, mm -hmm. sociology, and the church is teaching to show how everything's in harmony to understand where natural family planet comes from. And he did it in spades. It's a great, great book. Everything Jason has said on uh, NFP, I've loved too. He has. He had a DVD set called Life Giving Love. Mm. Um, interesting. I was at Catholic Answers when he recorded this DVD. It was initially called Green Sex. Yes, right? I remember yeah. that. I remember the CD. And then Green everyone at Catholic Answers was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> People are calling up, is this about aliens? That's like, right. what is this? So I think they changed it to, but it's excellent. He's good. No, no, he's very good. Yeah. So, so again, there's there's a lot out here depending on where you are. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for very practical things, again, the, the, the Emily Stimson and the Patrick Coffin with particular issues to get you the language mm -hmm. of, of this, you know, of theology of the body. But when you want to get into the teaching itself at some point, that's when you start getting into some of these, these close. Mary Shivanandan has got some fantastic, Dr. Mary Shivanandan from uh, Catholic University. Very, very good. Um, another resource just came out, Marriage and Sex. Was it um, it's from Catholic Answers? Um, yeah, check their, their resources are very good about marriage because it's very theology body based. Here's another obscure one that I'm a huge fan of. Mm. In the World Meeting of Families in 2015 in Philadelphia, they made a preparatory catechism, small little book mm. called The Family Fully Alive. This book, is, it's readable, really? it's short, it's like 10 chapters. It to me is one of the most eloquent and accessible Approaches to sex, marriage, family. What? The yeah. family fully alive. Why haven't I heard of it? Is it popular? Be, or I just it, it, it was limited publication, oh. and the whole event after the World Meeting of Families, everything just kind of went away. Okay. So I'm the one still going. We need Where more of these. We book? need more of these. Mm -hmm. But I, that look at them for you know eBay or go to joytobe.org and, and, and ask tell me us about, about that. Joy to be as we wrap up too. So joytobe.org is really this this final not final but this latest expression of um, wanting to serve families, wanting to serve uh, marriages and families in a way that leverages you know the years at the Theology Body Institute of teaching TOB to you know retreats at a very high level, graduate level, and um, the the. The, the person to person ministry that marriage preparation is, marriage enrichment, the natural family planning teaching. I mean, the thousands of couples that Melanie and I have worked with with NFP get you this, this privileged entry into people's lives. Yeah. That, you know, very few people but, allow you in and tread. So, Jordan B. What do you, yeah, what do you do? Like, what's the elevator pitch? I mean, do you well, create resources? Do you put groups together? So, the major deliverable now, the major initiative now is what we're calling Joyful Ever After uh, how to get the, getting the marriage you want from the marriage that you have. Love it. Right? Great tagline. So book, podcast, starting in the fall, um, uh, retreats, 
and really this gathering of couples to build these communities mm. of engagement under this banner of marriage being not just atomistic in our own, but really being a communal reality. Nice. Not forced, but really building friendships mm. in this journey. So, so Joyful what, Ever what After. What do people find then? Uh, Joyful Ever After gets released in the fall. Up until is, now. Is it a book or a series? It'll be a book. Okay. It's uh, The book is, is in the fall, but also more importantly is this um, online course that we're developing. Mm -hmm. Really, it's an online retreat more than a course. Mm -hmm. It's a chance to really, as a couple, to start unpacking in these wow, early years of marriage. Gosh, I want to get through that. that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's exciting because Joy to Be was built uh, under this banner, this vision, that the joy to be a man and the joy to be a woman is rooted in the joy to be loved as a son or daughter of God the Father. So that's kind of the, the pitch line there that we need to lead with joy and to use the theology of the body as the lyrics of this mm -hmm. music, but we're really teaching how love can can really instill a joy in your life, not just a happiness, but this, yeah. you know, eudaimonia and this, yeah. this beatitudio that, that really is about knowing who you are and knowing why you're here and it can endure suffering, it can endure hardship, and mm -hmm. in many ways it loves to suffer. So the joy to be a man, the joy to be a woman, is about restoring that right relationship with God. And marriage is a privileged place where you can get those answers, questions answered. Awesome. You're worthy to be loved, and others are willing and capable of fulfilling your needs. Mm -hmm. Glory. The world needs more joy, brother. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank As you. I pick my ear. That's yeah, I see that. That means we're over. Your hand. The... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, brother. All right, thanks so much. That's going to do it for us here on YouTube. Now we're going over to patreon.com slash mattfrad to finish this discussion. I'm going to ask Damon how he thinks uh, if you're a man or a woman struggling with porn, you should overcome it. Like, what do you need to do? I also ask him who he thinks the best speaker in the church is when it comes to human sexuality and why. We talk about some other things as well. You can get access to post-show wrap-up videos at patreon.com slash mattfrad. You can also get a bunch of other free things when you sign up as a patron. By doing that, you'll support The Matt Frad Show, you'll support Pints with Aquinas and all the work that we're doing here. So if you're already a patron, be sure to go over right now, patreon.com slash mattfrad. If you're not yet a patron and you want to support the show for a dollar a month or 10 bucks a month or more and see all the free gifts I give you in return, like a signed book or a beer stein that's super amazing, um, free audio video content that you wouldn't get otherwise, go to patreon.com slash mattfrad and you'll get access to this video as well as a bunch of other things. Now, if you don't like Patreon and want to just give to me directly, go to pintswithaquinas.com slash donate. That's pintswithaquinas.com slash donate and you can give there. All right, thanks so much.